Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to another installment of the Babbling Pastor Podcast with your favorite podcast hosts, Michael and... Wow, I'm a favorite too. Uh, I'm Rob. <laughs> yes, welcome today. I'm sure you saw with the uh, thumbnail that you've clicked on that today we're going to be covering something very interesting. I think I've probably scarred Rob for at least a little bit because we're covering this. Um, I'm doing uh, I'm, I'm doing quite a bit on these sort of guys. I'm intrigued. I'm, I'm just brought in. And I wanted to bring Rob into the nightmare that is now partially part of my life as I look into these yeah. individuals. Um we're going to be covering Demon Slayers today, Rob. Now, we're going to be walking through a video called The Secrets of Generational Curses, um, which, I mean, you've watched all the way through. I've watched all the way through. I know that you thoroughly enjoyed it. You're very happy that now your YouTube feed is full of this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled about that, actually. I, I was actually just thinking the other day, boy, my YouTube feed is boring. I could really use some some sprucing up of that and well it, it actually turns out that it is uh watching that video last night has aggravated the demons inside of me um so we'll see how this goes you know i'm, I'm sure it's gonna go great yeah. <clears throat> so guys we are actually we're gonna probably just jump right into this because this this video that we're going to be watching is an hour long now Two things. One, luckily for you, I break these podcasts up. So if you're watching this section, it's probably a shorter section. There will eventually be a full long video that you'll be able to watch. Maybe you're watching that now. It's going to be easily probably two hours long. So we're going to buckle in. We're going to get it right into it. I'm going to, I, uh, yeah, stretch that out. Oh, you're just, <laughs> I thought you were stretching. You're just buckling. In. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> He's buckling in for the ride. So, um, yeah. So we'll go ahead and get into it. I'm going to try not to interrupt too much because I want to make sure that this isn't super long. But there's definitely some stuff that we're going to come across uh, during this this video that is, um, well, I think it needs, it obviously, something needs to be said about it. So let's go ahead and let's hop in. We're going to start it. Are you ready? Do you need to do some breathing exercises or do you think you're ready to go? I've been doing um, like the Lamont's pregnancy breathing for about an hour in preparation for this. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready right. for the lab, laborious situation we're entering into. Okay. So uh, just so everybody knows, this video will be linked below. So you can watch the whole thing without me and Rob's commentary if you want, if you want to actually get into that. I don't know the guy that's in the white shirt. I don't remember his name. He may introduce himself. The guy on the other side is Alexander Pricotti. Um, he'll be doing most of the talking. So apparently he's a... I, by, by the way... By the way, did, did you find it? Um, so I've seen this cat's face before, but I've never, you know, until now. Do you find it interesting that like his last name is very closely like pagan? I'm just saying. <clears throat> I'm sure there's probably, I mean, we all get our names somewhere. I'm sure that uh, that might be back in the history somewhere. I don't actually know the history of any of these guys, which is something else I want to look into too. Because how do you get to this? Like how, how do you get to this? So... All right, here we go. What we're about to watch, I do want to warn you, this, the guy in the white shirt definitely looks up to and, uh, Alexander. Like, he is, uh, he loves him. So, let's go. He's, he's the front row mic'd guy. A hundred percent. That you talk about in the uh, other videos. Yeah, he's, right. he's like, whoa, oh, preach, bro. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah that is that's true. him. Yeah. Okay. All right, all right. I'm not going to belabor the point. Let's, let's go a well of knowledge. I love learning from you. You have such a unique revelation on so many things that I'm like, wow, I didn't even, you know, so let's, can we just jump in? On that note, Rob, if, if you, anytime you want to interject, just go ahead and jump in and I'll pause the video. Like, you don't just, I'm going to assume if you start talking, <laughs> then I'm going to pause it. And, 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 but before we jump in with this first thing, you're doing something super special. So on YouTube, you're constantly teaching. You're going live. I'm jumping in your. I'm I'm in your chat on the regular. So today, if people jump in, it's uh you you want to we want to try to crack 500 subscribers, right? And you are making a free ebook copy of your first book, Secrets of Deliverance, available. Is that true? Yeah. So um, we're trying to build um our youtube page we're almost we're literally almost at the cusp of 100k subscribers so what we're doing special is for the next 500 subscribers i'm counting it here we're gonna give you a i'm just gonna let you know i'm gonna speed this up i i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah this 
go ahead. And while you're doing that, um, I think it's a fair question to ask uh, in all seriousness, as we watch uh, and uh, as we watch this video and like go through it, um, this is obviously, so I looked at, uh, you can't see it from the screen right now, but this, this guy's channel has a hundred thousand subscribers, a little over that. Um, the, uh, Pagani, uh, uh, I refuse to call him apostle Pagani, uh, but his, his channel, um, he's shooting for that hundred thousand subscriber mark. So, and, and we said just before we started recording that this, this, particular video has a lot of views. So in my mind, one of the important questions that needs to come from this whole thing today is what is so attractive about this, right? Because people are falling prey to a lot of these things. So what about this is so, you know, alluring or, or, or whatever. So I think that's something that, because there are legitimate Christians who are maybe just uneducated yet or ignorant of, of biblical things that the, like young Christians that really or have just grown better. up in it. There's a lot of people that have yeah, reached right, out okay. like, yeah. Hey, I grew up in this and I didn't even know any different. Yeah. They just been told. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so I think it's, it's, uh, that's an important thing for us to assess, I think really, or at least think about, um, because there are a lot of people who apparently are getting, uh, getting into this. So, yeah. All right. Let's start it again. Hopefully free ebook copy for one hour for one hour, which means exclusively for those of you that are here, um, we'll give you a free ebook copy of the secrets to deliverance. That way you don't have to purchase it. And that way you can kind of follow along. If you're jumping in and getting to know us in part two, the secrets to curses, then you'll be able to have along with it. Um, it's predecessor. Uh, is that speed good or is that too much? I know. Okay. Oh, you're good. Some people hate 1.5. All right. Um, and it's the secrets to deliverance. So I'm going to be putting the links up in the chat room. So we want you to just go sub right now in our YouTube page, and then you'll get a free ebook copy of the secrets to deliverance available just for this broadcast for uh, right now, because I love all of you viewers that are watching right now. You guys are so generous. Listen, guys, I can't believe that's real. Uh, so go ahead. Matter of fact, if you don't have the book, go and subscribe right now. It's, it's okay to actually jump off my channel, go subscribe, come back. Or just open up two tabs or use another device. Go and do it right now. And let's crack 100K in the next 24 hours. I would love that. So Amen. go ahead and subscribe to his channel. Yeah, it's such good, 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 good content. So I just want to start by asking the question. Um, I'd love to hear your answer on this. I know that your new book, The Secrets to Generational Curses, is, is about this topic. But let's start with the fundamentals. What is a generational curse? Okay, so this is interesting. The, I'm just stopping to let you guys know. So the whole video is about the secrets of generational curses. And he's going to define it. Because there's some people that I've talked to that are like, well, a generational curse is just somebody in your family making a bad decision. And then that bad decision obviously affects you and it could affect, you know, generations after. And that is what a lot of people I think hear whenever they hear this term, at least maybe in the circles we grew up in, things like that. Like they wouldn't even call it a generational curse, but if you say that definition, that's what they're connecting with it. And what it would be like, heard, yeah, it would be like sin that dad or granddad did yeah. that still is plaguing you not not like sin that's passed down in the sense that like oh he was a gambler and so now i'm a gambler mm -hmm. but in the sense that like he was a gambler so now my whole family's just broke for a few generations and and then like that that kind of thing so it's different yeah and i, I that that is important because whenever I, I did make a post on Instagram about generational curses, and what I did find was there was this huge, and what really wanted, made me want to look into it is that there's this huge difference in definition. So what Alexander is going to define here is different than that, entirely different than that. Well, a generational curse or a curse is a warranted verdict given by the courtroom of heaven against a person, a household, a place that committed a transgression that warrants that level of penalty. Now, let me just first start off by saying that not every sin produces a generational curse. First John chapter five actually says that there are sins that do not lead unto death. And then there are sins that do lead unto death. And then it says, all wickedness is sin. You know, and I, I guess the, the apostle John wrote that for the heresy hunters. That, oh, my brother, are you saying that all sin, you know, not all sin is, 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 is wrong? No, the apostle John said all sin is wrong. But the text says, first John chapter five, not all sin leads unto death. Let me give you an example of how this works. If me and my argument had a, if me and my wife had an argument and the rapture happened, trust me, me and my wife will be arguing our way to heaven. <laughs> yeah. Because arguing with my wife doesn't warrant a generational curse. But if I commit adultery on my wife and the rapture might happen and I'm caught in the middle of adultery, well, now we're talking about the different degrees of penalty. This is why even in our uh, constitution, you have robbery in the first degree, robbery in the second degree, robbery in the third degree. The okay. same. Here we go. So just, just, just real briefly, like uh, it, it, if you're watching this video or listening to the podcast or whatever, um, I, 
I think something really helpful and we'll probably be doing this too, but something that will be really helpful is like throughout the whole thing, whenever he says anything, whenever he makes any assertion, think to yourself, where in the scriptures does it say that? Where in the scriptures does it say that? Because like all of like so much of the things that he just said, it's like, yeah, that's, that's not there. That that's not a thing. Like, I don't know where you came up with this. Um, you, you have to read into the scriptures to come up with this in the first place. And it doesn't say that in our constitution, by the way. Well, one of the things I thought I had a note here, which is what I was trying to look for. I did some, there, there is a particular person. I, I don't, I know I have it written down, but I can't find it that actually came up with the terminology courtrooms of heaven. It's a, it's a Pentecostal charismatic doctrine, um, in which, and, he, and you're going to, you're going to hear that language actually throughout this video. He's going to say it over and over again, because the entire, his entire system of generational curses is built upon this idea that there, there are, um, decrees sent down in the courtroom of heaven. And then you can also go to the courtroom of heaven and get those decrees overturned as well in various ways. Um, but a lot of what his foundational premise is, is that in heaven, God gives out verdicts based upon various sins. And then he juxtaposes that with the American legal system and degrees of sin or degrees of, uh, yeah. and penalties. But uh, and I'll try to find that. You guys will see me looking down while he's talking because I know it's in my notes. I just need to find it. But there is a particular individual from not too long ago that came up with that language. So is with the courtroom of heaven. So, yeah. So the demon and the curse are not the same, but the curse originates from the courtroom of heaven. It's the courtroom of heaven producing a verdict against a family, a place, a territory, a company, because that group of people or the individual has committed a sin that warrants that level of penalty and consequence. Mm, that is so good. So what you're saying, and I just want to break this down for people watching, because many of you are joining right now. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you haven't. Ring that bell notification and then drop a comment. Let us know where you're watching from. I see a lot of you guys entering right now. So let me ask you just straight up. So it, it, could it be that if somebody's dealing with chronic illness in their body, that that is a curse, but that that curse was not necessarily their own sin, but the sin of one of their ancestors, that they inherited that? Okay, so let's first, let's address, could a Christian have a generational curse? Let's just kind of go yeah. there a little bit before I actually answer that, because I can hear the theological wheels turn. Okay, so here, I do want you guys to really pay attention to this, because this is a very important part of the doctrine that he's building. So you have to understand, again, courtrooms of heaven is where the curses come from. God then gives them. But how do those then therefore get passed down and how can Christians still have them? And this, what he's about to say, is incredibly key to the entire process. If you want to understand how Alexander Pagati thinks about the transfer of curses, this is incredibly important. Everything he's going to say, and this this goes for every, as far as, I, as, as far as I've listened to and seen, everybody within his stream of thought, this is their scriptural justification for how this process happens turning in in various people's mind well it's impossible christian uh, can't be under a generational curse then why do christians that are born against spirit-filled believers still die in the natural like what let's nope. just answer that we're christian we're spirit-filled why do we still die in the natural why because what well, isn't that a generational curse still coming down from adam yeah See what I'm so like let's just kind of fix that so then you're probably saying okay your viewers are probably saying well what, well, what is the efficacy of christ's work on the cross accomplished very simple the cr the cross mm. broke the power of sin not the presence of sin just like the cross broke the power of the curse not the presence of curses so that's kind of like where we where we i think need to hang our theological tangents and just say you know what you know maybe a christian you know could be a generational curse so then how does one identify yeah maybe yeah. i have a generational curse this is the best way to identify it. it's found in two in, in two in two ways one, after you've crucified the flesh, if the problem persists, it's a demon. Watch this. Hmm. After you go through deliverance and the problem still persists, then it's a curse. Wow. That's how you, that's how you so identify it. Wow. <laughs> wow. Bro. Well, I, I, so, okay, first of all, um, what he's just done, and I'm, I'm not going to say that he's done this intentionally because I, I, I don't necessarily think that, but... Uh, what he's just done and what will continue to happen, because what he just said is a is is a foundational block for what the other stuff. Right. But what he's just done is like um, I'm oh, so I become a Christian. OK, um, I'm, I'm still battling my flesh, of course. Right. Like, there are still uh, ba battles to fight. There are still sins in me that that. And, and whenever this one's conquered, there will be others that the spirit reveals to me, right? That, 
that maybe through the word or through friends who are honest or whatever it might be. Right. Um, and what he's just done is so now I can I can blame that sin on a demon. First of all, and not take the responsibility for myself. And then when that when that's not the case now, OK, well, then it's a curse. Those are the two options that he gives. It, it couldn't possibly be. It couldn't possibly be what all of the New Testament writers say that you, you're still battling, that you're still going to battle your own sinful flesh. That couldn't possibly be that. It's either a demon and boo, once you've had that demon cast out, first of all, um, uh, the greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Holy Spirit of God that hovered over the face of the deep is in the Christian. That's how that works, which means probably not any room for a demon. Okay. But, uh, but let's just assume that Christians can have demons because this is what they're talking about, even though that's ludicrous. But, um, the, the blame for my sinfulness is now not mine to bear. It's it's not it's it's not something I need to repent of if it's caused by a demon. And certainly if it's caused by some generational curse, I need to be like, God oh, dang it, granddad, you know, well, it's literally uh, it's the not devil me. made me do it. It's literally the right, devil exactly right. Yeah. And so. Right. So like that's a huge, huge gospel level problem. Uh, um, and so that that will that that sounds really attractive. So remember I said, what, what makes this attractive? Well, that for sure. Right. That like, ah, oh, I keep struggling with porn or whatever it might be. Right. I keep, ah, I keep failing in this area. I'm so angry all the time, whatever. Um, but ah, oh, it's not really my fault. Praise God. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, cause his whole, and I, again, I want to make sure that we're representing his, his, point exactly how he says it which is why we're doing this whole video full out is that his idea is that if you're saved you then crucify the flesh however if after you know crucifying the flesh you still struggle with it which i would just say is sanctification but whatever if you still struggle with it even though you've laid it down again sanctification then it's got to be a demon so you get exercised from that demon or delivered is the word they prefer because exorcism is spooky apparently and then um if you still persist which then it is like you said a curse and then you have to go to the courtroom of heaven which he'll go into in a minute to even get rid of it then um so there's there, he has a a, a a like a built-out system for all of the questions you have but none of these and this is where i want to go to over and over again i want to keep telling you because the guy in the white shirt is going to be his cheerleader the whole time never like but the idea is that he says it's so good but the only verse we've referenced so far is first john five and we, we kind of took that one out of content. Like there's nothing built up on that. Now, one thing, and I won't get into it. We're going to get right back to the video. Robert Henderson is the pastor in my notes that popularized, popularized the concept of the courtrooms of heaven in his teaching. There's actually a video he has online. It's got 3 million views in which he goes through and talks about this concept. So it's one of the things that it's, um, this isn't a small thing. Like, obviously, it's a subset of within charismatic Pentecostalism, but it's clearly something that's growing because these guys all have a ton. Like, these are two of, like, five people I know that, that talk like this and are very popular. Um, so let's, let's keep going. All right, so let's, let's, let's look at, let me say it again. After you gouge out your eye because your eye causes you to sin, if you find you're still lusting, then you have a demon of lust. If you go through a deliverance session and you find yourself still lusting after you've uh, gotten multiple deliverance sessions, now you're dealing with a generational curse of lust and perversion. The same as with sickness, the same as with uh, uh, hereditary patterns of behavior. It is all there and it is actually scriptural. So that is the best way that a Christian can say, you know, maybe maybe I could not, not just be dealing Where? with uh, sickness. Yeah, exactly. Where is the scripture? Yeah. Yes. Maybe yeah. terminal sickness is run... Oh, sorry, you want to say something real quick or no? <laughs> Abraham, Abraham, um, Abraham uh, instituted along with then Moses after him and Aaron instituted peanut butter and jelly as the uh, it's scriptural, right? As the main uh, meal during the Passover. That's mm, part of the so it's good. part of the Passover. So good. It's in there. So good, Rob. It's in so there. Good. Uh, PB and J and it's grape jelly, by the way, apple can be substituted if, um, but that it, it's in there. I mean, it, so the, 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 the lamb that's slain and the, you know, horseradish, the bitter herbs and those kinds of things, that's all part of it, the grape jelly. So, 
Uh, it's scriptural. It's in there. It's a good parallel. What I yeah. did just now is what he's doing the whole time in the video. It's like, where? What? What are you talking about? Where does it say that? Sorry, this is going to be super long. If I keep no, that's doing fine. That. Hey, ahead. this is why this is why we break the podcast up. Run through our bloodline, and maybe it needs to be resolved in the courtroom and not necessarily through a deliverance session. Oh, this is so good. Come on, everybody, hit the thumbs up on this video right now if this is helping you already. You know what I love about the way that you teach? It's so profound, and there's such a level of depth, but then it's digestible. It's like that just clicked, and there's so much bad information. Some of you guys are YouTube theologians. You know what I mean? You've never even read a book, and so you've got opinions, but this to me is bringing so much peace because it's clarity. Now, I want to piggyback off that because we're kind of flowing together right now. And you know, what does the book of Ezekiel mean when God says kicking about in your own blood? And then there's this other phrase, no one can uh, cut your umbilical cord. How is, how uh, is that connected? Listen, I talk about- Okay, so this is where, um, man, I really wish I had my notes better. I'm gonna look up exactly where he's reading from Ezekiel from this, because he's not gonna Ezekiel, tell us. He's in Ezekiel 16. Okay, good. I'm glad uh, you're, you're, you're on the ball here. So what I would encourage, same thing with the sermon review, guys. If you watch the sermon reviews, this is the same thing I encourage you to do. Go to that particular passage so that you can find where, uh, you know, what he's reading, and then you can have the idea of what is, um, what, what is around this as well. Rob, do you know what verse he's starting in? 16? Or is it just the beginning? Well, it's, it's kind of just the beginning. So this uh, okay. uh, squirming in your blood is verse 6. Okay. But, I mean, he's... He's, he's really taught, I mean, the heading in most of your Bibles is going to say something like Jerusalem plays the harlot, right? I mean, that's what's being talked about here. Yeah, okay, and that's important to understand. So if, you, or if you're listening or watching, go ahead, you can pause this, get to Ezekiel 16, start and probably maybe read through 16 through probably 14, and that'll give you an idea of the context, and then here is Alexander uh, going through it about that extensively in my book, The Secrets uh, to Ge uh, Generational Curses. But that is, for me, the ace in the hole uh, when it comes to generational curses and like hands down, mic drop moment. The book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel is given a vision concerning uh, the nation of Israel. Obviously, most of the vision uh, that Ezekiel is receiving is in reference to, if you want to be exegetical, is in reference to the nation of Israel. But also, we are the nation of Israel spiritually. We are the spiritual yeah. descendants. Of okay, you see what he just did? See, that's <laughs> important, guys. That's important. So he acknowledges the fact that, yeah, this is totally to Israel. Exegetically, if you're going to look at it that way, you have to understand that it's to Israel. This is about Israel. But, and this is how we're now going to read on top of it. So this ace in the hole, he already admits, is read on top of. Like to make The, the this thing right. is, the thing is, he's not wrong necessarily, or, or completely at least. It's just that, this particular text is not written to <coughs> those who are Abraham's seed, right? Like in the new, like it's not written to us or about us. It's written specifically about national Israel during the, a specific time. And that's the application. We can take what Israel did in whoring herself back then at that point. We can take that and apply it to us and see like okay how am i maybe doing this that kind of thing right but but we we can't but he 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 does it very cleverly like he's he's very clever in how he does that because it sounds like seamless this transition right but but when you start reading in ezekiel 16 um something that's specifically written about israel and then you immediately follow that with, but you know, like we're we're Israel, and um, so da 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 da, right? And then he starts talking about this in a way that Ezekiel would have been like, "What uh, man? Did I write that wrong? What are you even talking about?" Like, well, and it's, it's very similar. Crazy. He doesn't mention it in this video. They don't. But when they uh, sometimes when people talk about generational curses, they reference Deuteronomy 26, 27, 28, I think, or somewhere around there where God says the curse is for Israel. They ignore the beginning where I think it's at Moab is where they are. And, you know, there's the covenant being made to them. And then specifically after all these curses are, uh, this is what happens if you do this. And this is the curse if you do this. It says, and this is where they they made a covenant with the Lord. And so they're, they ignore the fact that this this is a specific covenant made with a specific people. Now you can learn a whole bunch from it. There's a whole lot you can learn about what God is for and what he's against and what he, you know, what he commands and what he doesn't. But that covenant, you have a new one. 
<laughs> you have a new and better covenant in Christ. And so like this, this is important here. And like what you said, it's, it's, there, there are bits here that, that are, that are true and familiar because I'm sure people have heard like, oh, the church is, you know, again, this goes into a whole lot of different theology just in and of itself. Yeah. But the idea is that, oh, well, this, this makes sense then because I've heard one part. So if I, if I've already heard the whole, the church is Israel, um, then, or I don't know if he said the spiritual Israel. Anyway, he makes that connection there. And then he goes right into, okay, so now when we read this, even though exegetically this is Israel, because you are as a believer now grafted into Israel, then, or I don't know the words he uses, but the point is it's, yeah, like you said, it's seamless. Of Abraham by faith in Christ. So what he's actually talking about is this. If you read it, it's he's speaking in parabolic form to help Israel understand what's going on. And he starts off by saying, this is this is this, this statement here blew me away. And I don't want to give too much away because you need to go get the book. And we'll be yeah. we'll be putting we'll put the link in the chat room in a few. All right, let's get these numbers up to 500 subscribers, and now we can give you the book. He starts Hit off by saying likes. this. God starts off the prophetic declaration by saying this: You are nothing but a Canaanite, and your mother is an Amorite. <laughs> by default, he's That's already talking three. about that. Verse three, okay. The root issues of all of your national problems is the direct result of that you're not really a Hebrew in origin. You're actually a Chaldean. You're a Canaanite and what? an Amorite in your root. And he actually says, your father was nothing but a Canaanite and your mother was an Amorite. And then he says this, and I walked by you when no one paid attention to you wow. and I called you to myself. Boom, that's salvation. That's salvation yeah, right there. Yeah. And then it says, but because you were still young and not ready for love, which means covenant, which yeah, means covenant, yeah. I kept going. Look what it says, I kept going, allowing you to kick about in your own blood. And then I passed by again, this is what he says, I passed by again and I saw you kicking about in your own blood or your own bloodline issues. Yep, yep, yep. And then it says, because... I just want to point out that one, we're, we're paraphrasing the whole thing. Secondly, because we're paraphrasing the whole thing, we're able to read in bloodline issues when bloodline issues isn't there. But because that's the base of his, his theology, because of how original sin is passed down. And again, he's even operating on a very Augustinian sort of idea of uh, uh, passing how, or how sin is passed. But um, yeah. No one cut the umbilical cord from the moment you were conceived, which means the Christian can be born again, but then God, you might not necessarily be ready for a deliverance session or d dealing with generational curses. Why? Because God wants to begin to deal with you with your foundational issues, your born again experiences and helping you mature. And then, you know, you, your newfound faith. But nevertheless, you belong to him. He claimed you as his, mm. but the umbilical cord hasn't been cut until you're ready. And that's when the Christian starts dealing with uh, things that even though they're growing in their Christian faith, they hit this roadblock, they hit this this wall, this this invisible wall that's there, and they're doing everything right. The issue is a deliverance issue or a generational curse issue. And then it says this, I cut the umbilical cord, mm. I wiped you clean from your blood or your bloodline issues, watch this, and then I declared marriage vows unto you. I declared marriage vows unto you and I dressed you, uh, I adorned you, which means up to that point, you're Christian, still dealing with bloodline issues, not ready for high levels of the anointing and ministry. Wow. And then God revisits you, and then he breaks the generational curse, and now you're ready to covenant with God in the area of intimate relationship, and then get adorned with high levels of the anointing, uh, depending on what God has called you to do. And then it says from there, it says, and then you grew exponentially, watch this, and then it says, and now you were ready to make love and now reproduce. It actually, the whole chapter, Ezekiel chapter 16, is talking about the nation of Israel, but it's also paralleling yeah. uh, believer with generational curses you gotta get the book you gotta get the book i'm gonna put the link a little bit in the chat room you gotta get it because i go into more extensively what that adornment means and what the kicking about in your own blood and no one cut the umbilical cord which means churches and no one helped you cut your bloodline connection to your amorite and your canaanite roots and therefore you're saved but you're kicking about in your own blood which means you're having bloodline issues and you need someone to wash you and cleanse you from all of that and then it's make covenant with you man we, you got me preaching here you got me preaching preach and now listen you guys gotta get the book i mean this this entire stream is to start a conversation i want you to continue the book here's the thing though it's possible it's possible to be saved but be in chains and okay i just want to start right there with that issue like he says this over and over again you can be free but in prison like this doesn't make sense like there is a there is a very specific uh theological understanding of what sanctification is right and that is what the believer goes through. So there is justification, sanctification, glorification. This has been established throughout all of church history of this idea of you are justified by Jesus at the cross when you when you when you're saved and you know you submit to him. And then there's this process of sanctification through one's life in which there is a, and Rob's already described it, which is this continually laying down uh, things that the Spirit brings before you. 
And so there's just this weird idea that he's going to, this guy's going to say over and over again, which is, Hey, you can be saved, but still in chains. <laughs> and so, yeah. So, um, from Ezekiel 16, turn the page, uh, maybe like twice to Ezekiel 18. Okay. Ezekiel 18. Um, and so let's see here. Verse four, behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father, as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins will die. And then he goes on and on and on down to verse 20. Okay. The soul who sins will die. The son will not bear the iniquity of the father, nor will the father bear the iniquity of the son. Uh, The righteous, the righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. But if the wicked man turns from all his sins, which he has done and keeps all my statutes and does justice and righteousness, he shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions, which he's done, will not be remembered against him because of his righteousness, which he has done. He will live. Um, It seems pretty plain to me that the whole generational curse thing is, at least in the way that they're talking about it, is put to bed literally a couple of pages later in chapter 18 of Ezekiel. It's like it makes everything they've just talked about laughable. Plus, there's no mention, literally no mention of generational curses in chapter 16. They're, they're inserting the idea of generational curses into that text. Yeah. I'll shut and, up. And that, no, no, you could, you could. And that's one of the things that, again, I mean, agree or not agree with this video or what we're saying, but the idea is that if, if we're going to make some sort of um, a theological statement or build a doctrine, it should be able to be built off what the scriptures say without having to insert something into them. Now, Alexander does this a few times already. He continues to do this where he'll insert bloodline or generational curses on top of, on top of the the scripture that we're using and then just go on as if that is um, like a duh, like, Oh, of course. Of course, this is what this says, because this is the concept. But to get to that point, you have to be operating on something that he set up way back here that doesn't make sense and isn't founded biblically. So he set up at the beginning of this video, well, generational curses are something that you could have because if you crucified the flesh, but that doesn't get rid of it. If you've been delivered, but that doesn't get rid of it, then it's a curse. And it's this idea that curses are passed down from the courtrooms of heaven. And so he tries to use 1 John 5 to talk about that. We now have Ezekiel chapter 16 that he's tried to bring on in that. In both cases, we've had to read things into the text to get anywhere close to what he's talking about. And I think that, like, Rob, again, just read out straight from the scripture in Ezekiel 18 without having to summarize or interject, whereas Andrew, uh, Alexander... I mean, he admits on its face, yeah, this is to Israel, and then kind of usurps that a bit in a way that's very, um, very easy for somebody to maybe buy into, I suppose. All right, let's keep going. Rob, Rob's going to be so mad at me by the time we're done with this. <laughs> And there's many of you that confess Christ as your savior, went to church every single Sunday. Nobody ever talked about demons. Nobody ever talked about a curse. And you were like, you just felt guilty. Why do I keep relapsing back into sin? Why do I keep struggling in these ways? And there's many of you that it's just this season of your life that you get, somebody actually tells you what the word of God says, that you're coming into higher levels of, of, of the glory, higher levels of the higher anointing. Levels and of I glory. love, I love, love, love this. Um, you know, for me, and I just want to quickly tell people, we, my family was like this. My mom, you know, she took us to church. She saw a value in that. She accepted Christ as Messiah. He's Savior. You know, let us do the sinner's prayer. It wasn't until several years of going to church that we finally got this revelation on generational curses and deliverance. And then, then we shifted into another level. And there's many of you that are like, what is my next level in Christ? I, you know, this is it. And, and, and so this is so, 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 so important. You know, I... I remember Paul talking about different levels of Christ. John, yeah, he talked about it too. Something that I feel like many people deal with and and they're watching online right now and they have these mental struggles. You know, anxiety is increasing. Some of you have panic attacks. You're Christians that go through debilitating fear. It's crippling, uh, maybe a lot of doubt. You know, you're constantly experiencing that. Can you maybe talk a little bit about the curses of the mind 
And, and, you know, why is God focused on the human forehead? And, and I, I just because it, for me, I think I got, you know, hundred, hundreds of thousands of subscribers and followers and people. And there's so many times where I deal with the mind and, and I just get a lot of feedback about that. And I feel like God has gifted you in that area to help people experience freedom. So maybe you could talk about specifically curses of the mind. You know, well, not every sin produces a curse of the mind, but there are a couple that actually do. Mm. The Bible actually talks about um, stubbornness or stiff neckness. Wow. And you find that that becomes uh, one of the catalysts of the nation of Israel uh, to be perpetually uh, given over uh, to other uh, other nations around them to uh, years of years of years of slavery. But what you do find is, is that when a believer refuses to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the Bible actually says whatever uh, is not done of faith is actually sin, which means failing to take control of your mind can produce sins of the mind that convert themselves uh, or evolutionize themselves from one degree to the next. So you start off like this. You start off with uh, uh, defilement, and then it goes from, it starts off with contaminated to corrupted, to defilement, uh, to detestable. It's, it's continuously stages. Now, the contamination stage doesn't produce a generational curse, why? because you can't control the thoughts that come in your mind, but you can control them from staying there. Wow. But if you don't remove them, then they go from stronghold to strong man. Now we're, now we're dealing with a vice grip that's, that's kind of like, like there. And then perpetual long years, uh, seasons of not fighting against the stronghold of your mind uh, ends up becoming iniquitous. Mm. So it, now the, the genetics of how your mind thinks begins to get altered and it shifts everything. Why? Because the Bible says, as a man thinketh, as a man thinketh, so is he. So that means your thoughts to some degree can, can actually shift the nature of who you are as a person wow. to go from a place of contamination to corruption. And this is why the apostle Paul said, I fear, he said, I fear that as the, the devil deceived Eve, so your minds will be corrupted. Now watch this. When a mind is corrupted, that means it's completely shifted and cannot be uncorrupted. Why? Because now I just want to interject real quick. One, you look very sad, but two, uh, <laughs> two, there, um, there is a, ta there is something happening here. And again, I don't want to accuse a Alexander of this, but this, this happens a lot when I watch a lot of sermons, uh, clearly this isn't one, but this is another reason I think, you know, expositionally preaching through the word is very helpful is that he's throwing out a lot of Paul said this, the Bible says this without giving any actual anchoring text. So as which to go back and verify these with at this point, it's all on his authority. It's, Oh, well, Alexander said that the Bible said this and there's no way for you to go back. I mean, you could, you could write it down and then, you know, go on the Google and search and you'll find the verse, but it's going to be extra steps for you. And I'm pretty sure that most people aren't going to take those extra steps, especially those that really like Alexander, because they're not going to doubt what he's saying at all. And so it's just going to be duh. And so th this, I just always say this during the sermon reviews. I'll say it again here. Like, it's incredibly important that this is anchored in te the text so that you can go verify that. And this is, again, why when somebody preaches, I'm just going to say topical is not terrible, but expositionally working through the text is better because it is all lined up there and you can verify it as you're doing it. So, Well, yeah, and I would argue even topical sermons that are good are good yeah. because they expositionally preached from the text. <laughs> yeah. All right. Do we need a break? Do we need... Just breathe it Dude, out. <laughs> I'm glad you stopped it when you did. It, it's, you know, even if we don't have anything to say from time to time, it's going to be helpful just for my own um, sanity to to pause it and say something, right? Um, yeah, you 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 hit it on the head. And not only, not only are you seeing him um, do what you're talking about, where he'll say, Paul talks about da 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 but he, he doesn't actually quote the verses even, right? Not, not only like you don't hear where he's talking about it, but he, he doesn't even um, quote the specific verses. He'll just continue like to paraphrase, right? Like that's, that's what his game is. He'll, you know, I don't want to make it sound like, but that, that's what he's doing, right? He'll paraphrase something that he, that Paul maybe said or whatever. So not only are you left with no reference point, but you're also left with like something iffy to even Google, right? To look it up yourself because it's just paraphrased. Like, um, I, I think, um, so, uh, Abraham's peanut butter and jelly, right? I mean, that's, yeah. All right. Let's keep going. Of the nature of a thing, the nature of something has now been degraded. And once it shifts to that level, 
sometimes the only thing left for it to be done with is that's when God gives it over to a reprobate mind. And I deal extensively with a seared conscience and a reprobate mind and a strong delusion. This is why, because they not love, they love not the truth. God gave them over to a strong delusion, which means now they are cursed in the mind that even if the truth is presented to them, now they can no longer understand the truth. Seared conscience means the inability to distinguish between right and wrong because they've given themselves over to that. So now that is a place of their mind is cursed. Uh, not only that, their conscience becomes cursed. So that's why it is imperative that the believer is continuously as the lord's prayer is in matthew chapter 6 consistently praying mm. deliver me from evil daily deliverance lord deliver me from evil now i'm not saying a phobia of god my mind is going to get you know overturned and corrupted no but lord take control of my mind this is why the apostle paul said whatever is virtue whatever is a praise if there be a good report think on these things when a christian fails to do so after a long period of time it goes from transgression a mind that's filled with transgression to a mind that is iniquitous which means now the nature of that mind begins to get corrupted and now you no longer need to be tempted to do those things now now you're tempted by your own lust, James chapter one, which means now instead of lying, you're a liar. You okay, you clearly need to say something. <laughs> Look, are are we not always tempted by our own? Like, is there a step before that, right? Where, where like I'm tempted, but it has nothing to do with my evil desires. Uh, but I'm just I'm just tempted, just in a vacuum or because there's a demon in me or something like that. I think a couple of the premises that, that um, are behind some of, uh, well, that are behind what he's talking about is one that as a Christian, so he's talking about believers here. Yeah. Right. Yeah, which he's is not important. talking about unbelievers at all. No. Yeah. Right. And Romans one, which is some of what he's quoting from, I think um, is, is not talking about, um, Christians who eventually God gives them over. Uh, that That's not what it's talking about. That's not the context. It's, it's This is the unbelieving world that God gives over to the lusts of their mind, a, that God gives point, over, yeah. you know? And so this, this a, a lot of what he's saying, um, well, first of all, a lot of what he's saying is just stuff that is coming out of his mouth. Like, and I think one of the dangers with him being a, air quotes, apostle, is that this is this is the kind of authority that people give him. They just hear what he says, and automatically it's, ooh, to be taken as as gospel truth, right? Um, and and you can't do that. Like, even, even the actual apostle, Paul, um, uh, w was happy uh, that the Bereans would go back and because everything that he said he, he said in context he he made his points like the book of hebrews right would have been much like uh what what paul would have done in the synagogue on the mm, regular yeah right mm. and um and and that whole thing is taking scripture and painting the picture and saying this is this is the messiah this is the christ and this is what he's accomplished and um, and so, but, but Paul didn't just rip things out of places and, uh, and, uh, like he's, he's saying so many things, the different levels da, 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 all of this stuff that he's talking about is just like, we're just supposed to take his word for it. And there's, um, there's not even an attempt to give scripture references for a lot of it because it's just, it's just made up stuff that's well, yeah. coming from his mind. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's, and again, I, I, I'm about to say something. So I'll acknowledge that I have it on 1.5, but even if you watch it at normal speed, there is a lot coming at you all at once that, yep. um, that there is this assumption that he's just right. Like there's just this assumption. And so if he's going to say it now, um, I wish I knew the guy in the right, the guy in the white. I don't remember his name, but there's there's lots of times where he's a great demonstration of that. Like, oh, great, oh, this great word. That's a great revelation. That's a great you know uh, insight from the scriptures without giving actual any backing for that. So he's working, and I just want to make this before we get back into it. He's working from uh, a I'll call it loosely. <laughs> It hurts me to say this, an exegetical foundation. Oh, that hurt. Okay, so he's working loosely from one of those um, with the assumption that anything he says, therefore, is correct. 
So if you're if you're listening to him and you're, I mean, he's not even assuming you're in his congregation. Anybody listening to him, he's assuming that you're just going to say, yeah, cool. I don't need scriptural references. I don't need any sort of backup to this. You said it. You wrote a book on it. At one point, he's not been called it yet, but I think near the end of the video, he gets called the for, uh, the one of the forefront authorities on this subject. So this isn't just some rando that's talking about this. Apparently, at least within this little bubble of theological thought, he's known as like the expert on this generational curses thing. And so if you want to know what it's about, you go to him. So, so let's go ahead and uh, let's get back into this. All right, so let us jump back into this video. Hopefully, I didn't mess this up. That's how it works. In the beginning, you're lying, failing to repent of that. Now your nature gets changed, and now you're just a liar. So now you have a Christian. So then now all these other instances in the epistles begin to get put in play where now you begin to question whether you're even a believer or whether you lost your salvation, you know, and that's a whole other topic there. Hmm. But that's kind of like where it starts. It starts in the mind. Another example of this if yeah, you going. is Cain. Cain is a perfect example of thoughts unregulated that became a curse. And what did God do to Cain? He said, now you are cursed. And because you are cursed, I put a mark on your forehead, which means inability to understand truth and repent. And therefore, all this other stuff kind of kicks in, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So it is dangerous. We're just putting Cain. <laughs> We're mixing our covenants. Man. We're mixing our covenants a lot here as far as like what, ha what, what happens uh thoughts lead to actions there there's okay let's just keep you, it's gonna you're, be a... you're not you're not gonna come away if you read everything about cain in the whole bible in context and study it all you want you you're not going to walk away with half of what he just said this is his framework imposed on that story which is what continuously happens here okay let's go oh no i've messed it up hold on here we go to make sure uh, in not renewing your mind because your mind can actually be altered and it is the gateway to everything else that we do in functioning in our lives as a christian oh that is so good have you all bought this book already the secrets to generational curses i mean we're spamming the chat and the pinned comment is the actual link to the book my expectation is that every single one of you get this book right now because christians need to understand this apostle pagani is such a deep well of revelation for this generation these books are i mean we're, we're speaking to one of the foremost writers on the topic and there, so that's where he says it. He's the foremost writer on the topic. So if you want to know, according to, and Rob, you just told me what this guy's name was in a message and I forgot, Mike Singarelli. So according to Mike Singarelli, Alexander Picotti is the foremost expert on this topic of generational curses. And so unless there is some weird revelation in which he exegetically breaks down verse by verse and gives examples of this in his book, um, so far, I'm not being convinced by the scriptures that this this generational curses, as he's talking about them, um, are, are scriptural at all. Now, I really wish we would I would have taken better notes and had some time to break down what he said last. But we're only 20 minutes into an hour, and you guys are saints that you've already made it 50 minutes into this. So let's go. We have him here available in real time. What a, what an incredible privilege. But I'm thinking about how many people have not been told these things. And, and you know, we've been talking about this a lot, but it's like your spirit Praise gets God. regenerated. Your, your, your mind must be renewed, but then your body must be resurrected. And Come Christians on. don't understand this. And it's like, that, that's how it's possible that your spirit gets regenerated and the Holy Spirit dwells inside of your spirit. And that is you, the eternal essence of you. Your mind needs to be renewed because it's constantly going back to a former state. And you've Come got to take thoughts captive. Everything that erects itself up against the word of God, pull it down. You know, you've got to go through that process, but then your body, as you mentioned, is going to die and must be resurrected. Come and, on. and so you can be under the influence of demons in your body, which needs to be resurrected in your mind. There's this very, I didn't Come notice on. it. I, I didn't notice it till now. And I, I don't, I hope this isn't what they're saying, but there's this very dualistic nature happening here. Like there's this very spirit, good flesh, bad situation occurring. Like, I mean, basically what he said was that your spirit man is saved but your flesh is bad and therefore like i i don't know i don't there he hasn't outright said there's this dualistic thing but it's it seems to be playing on those lines mind which needs to be renewed and this is the fundamentals of of what we've been trying to teach and so maybe you could talk a little bit because you know I, what i hear you saying is that there is a progression that christians can go and maybe it just starts with a thought and you said a phrase i love it from stronghold to strong man 
I've often given the example of if you leave your front door open, you know, probably a squirrel or a raccoon is not immediately going to come in. Right. Like, you know, you have Saul who was vexed by demons and come on. David who wasn't. That's kind of confusing because didn't David mess up with Bathsheba? Didn't come David on. arrange for the murder of her husband? I mean, David wasn't a good dude either. Why wasn't he vexed by demons like Saul? Well, and I love the way you said this. It was David was quick to repent. It right. would open the door, but yeah. then you quickly close the door. And it's the same thing. You bring in the groceries from your house, you open the door. You know, you don't have a deer just waiting for you to crack that door open to kick it off the hinges. But then what happens is if you do leave that door open, which is the analogy of unrepentant, rep repetitive sin, then I'm saying over a period of time, you will have an infestation. Things will come in. So I hear you talking about. So I, I want to I get your thoughts on this, because this example that he's using is very much um, speaks of someone that doesn't seem to be in community, doesn't seem to be in discipleship, doesn't seem to understand their own sin. Like there's no, there's, there doesn't seem to be an actual change of heart in this individual that just keeps doing this thing over and over and over again without repenting. Like that, that's the key. He said, you do it, but you don't like Saul has the demons because he didn't repent. David had the de didn't have demons because he repented. And then he said, so some of you are just doing the same thing over and over and over again and not repenting. And therefore you're opening yourself up to demons. But it seems like if you're doing the same sin over and over again and not seeking some sort of repentance or, 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 and they'll bring this verse up later and confessing your sins one to another, like, where is the spiritual place of that person anyway? Like if, if I have somebody in my church that's just sitting and sitting and sitting and not repenting and claiming to be a believer, I'm not sure you are. Like, that's the first thing right there. Like if you're just continually sinning without repenting. What is the definition of that person, if not, you know, not a believer? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think a good place to go for this is uh, the Beatitudes, um, because it, it really is describing. So the Beatitudes are, are one of um, a few obvious places in the scriptures to go for the Christian to uh, who struggles with their own assurance of salvation um, to go and and work through some of the text there and see things that they should be seeing in themselves to give them assurance okay so um and it begins with blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven it's where it all starts with you understanding before god i am broke i have nothing to offer god i have no good in me i i like and and, and i have nothing to barter with like i can't go to god and say you know what? I'll tell you what, I'll do this and you save me, right? Like that's that we can't do that, right? The second beatitude is blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. It's not talking about funerals, right? It's talking about mourning for your sin, mourning because you're poor in spirit, mourning because you're sinful. Um, and, and so that this is one of the first and most obvious marks of a Christian is that we we hate our sin we hate that we sin we hate it even though we do like that there's that tension in romans chapter 7 with paul even which is one of the most encouraging places in all of the scriptures to go uh for me because there there is just such a war that's happening all the time in the christian life and um and, and there there have been many times in my christian walk that i've thought like, am I even a Christian when I look myself in the mirror of God's word, right? Um, and and so I have to go back. I have to continuously uh, go back to the gospel, go back to the... But um, if, I said all that to say, if you're someone who claims to be a Christian, who continues to sin rampantly in obvious ways, and who doesn't repent, even though you know about it, who's not, who doesn't have a bent or a spirit that is pointed toward repentance or mourning for your sin or whatever, then I, then I think that's cause for you to actually question, am I actually a Christian or not? Because that's, a, that's the most basic descriptor of a Christian. It's not that we're perfect. It's not that we don't sin anymore. Um, it's that we hate it. <laughs> it's that we that we mourn our sin we mourn that we sin we repent we don't we don't want to sin even though we do you know like it's we're warring against the flesh in us and so um i i think a lot of the people that they're describing so there are christians who struggle with addictions of sorts or something like that and 
And so in that sense, they're repeating the same thing over and over again. And, but they hate it. They, yeah, they that's the difference. They don't want to yeah. be repeating it over and over again. And they're stri- They're trying to figure out, how do I get out of this? And so I, I don't think that there's someone who's just continuously repeating, um, uh, you know, like oh, I'm smoking crack on the regular and I'm repeating it's the, the demon yeah. over and over again. Um, and there's like that. There's that's that's actually not a Christian. The person who does this over and over again and doesn't feel the need to repent, doesn't feel the like. Um, and so he's he's it's actually kind of oxymoronic what he's talking about, because it seems on one hand, it seems like he's saying on one hand, he's describing this person who just doesn't feel this need to repent, who doesn't repent and just continuing to go over and over again. But then on the other hand, this same person uh, does want to get better, doesn't want to be doing this. Right. Uh, and like those two things don't really go together. Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and get back into progression. It. Um, I hear you talking about unrepentant. Right. Uh, and so what happens now? And I don't you know what happens now? Like what about the people who are listening who are like, this is me. I am a Christian by title, but I meditate and dwell on lust, perversion, doubt, fear, anxiety, worry, whatever. I'm, I you know I have now unforgiveness. I am that person that's gone from stronghold to strong man, that I am that person that's now gone into borderline reprobate. What does that mean? Right. What? Do what? What does he mean by that? Do you know what he means by that? Stronghold to strong man? So he's using Alexander's language. So within, um, so the only thing I can go back to is like a, a sermon that Greg Locke preached that I reviewed in which he, and again, I, I don't know if this is what either of these guys hold to. But in the sermon that Greg Glock preached on strongholds, he was talking about how if a person has a demon um, and doesn't deal with it, it will build a stronghold in your life. And then he goes to the verse where Paul talks about tearing down strongholds. And so he he draws a a line, a comparative one-to-one line there with if you have a demon, you don't deal with it, and it builds a stronghold in your life. Though you're saved, the demon goes, but the stronghold is still there, and therefore you have to tear the, tear the stronghold down. And he uses Jesus' um, when he, he talks about if you one demon goes out, then uh, it comes back, and um, the whole, uh, he brings how many ever with it like it. Um, that that's what he's that's what he's referring to, so um, I, that that's my guess is what he's referring to. Also, I understand that I've frozen. I don't know how I've frozen, but I have. Um, so I'll try to fix that here in a minute. But yeah, I'm in North Dakota and you're frozen. That makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's a this stupid Mac update is <laughs> messing with my entire camera. Anyway, so let's go ahead. Uh, but I think that's what he means. So. I think a lot of these different definitions are converging together. So Greg Locke talks, uh, if, he, if they have any similar sort of idea, this is sort of what Andrew was already, to, Alexander rather, I'm sorry, was talking about before, that if you don't deal with it, you go from uh, like debased mind to degenerate or something, whatever progression he was talking about. So this idea is that if you don't deal with the stronghold, it becomes stronger and worse. And then uh, that's in their mind, a believer, if you, you can be a believer and not deal with the demons and strongholds and therefore they get worse. And now you're uh, you, uh, what this other guy, Mike Singarelli just said, now you're dancing on the borderline of degeneracy because you haven't dealt with everything before. And so there's this, again, all of this theology thought process built on, you have to go all the way back to the premise we started with, which is this generational curses is a some sort of verdict from heaven to you. And so like this all is built on this, this foundation. So it's confusing to me one, because I didn't grow up in it, but two, because I don't have any, you're not giving me any biblical background for it. You're using biblical words like stronghold that Paul uses. um, But you're, you're interjecting things here that are just really confusing um, in regards to how you're using those words. So, all right, I'm going to try to fix this while this goes. Yeah, and yeah, what can. do I do? Because I know there's people, I can feel it in the spirit right now, who are like, what do I do? Well, let me let me add to that statement. You just said stronghold to strong man. There's a third part, to strong Uh-oh. to strong case, the case in the heaven. So some stronghold to strong man to strong case. So that's how it works. It all starts um, in the courtroom of heaven. I guess the first thing for your viewers to understand is if they are aware right now 
their present need of freedom in this area, then they're in a very good place. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is still working with them and revealing it to them. Uh, most of the time, not all the time, but a large percentage of the time, when something gets to the place of getting cursed by heaven, it becomes immensely hard. Immensely hard. We're talking about a Christian having a generational curse. We're not talking about an unbeliever that's cursed by default because uh, they're not in covenant with God. We're talking about a Christian that has committed something that initiated the curse because the Bible says a curse doesn't come without a cause or they inherited it uh, based oh, on is... generations of their blood. Sorry, there you go. I wasn't able to pause it in time. A curse comes with a cost. I don't know where he's referring to. But, but, but is it generational? If I have to commit adultery, let's say, to, to begin the curse, then is it generate like did did granddad do like I don't understand that seems contradictory so, to me. So here's how as far as again, they don't say it here. I've listened to a bunch of these guys. What it seems yeah. to be is that this idea is that you could be the starter of the generational curse as well. Okay. So it goes back to I mean okay. logically logically speaking, we would all have generational curses at this point i mean if, if, we're, if we're being logical about it and going way back like it would it be impossible for not all of us to have demons i mean it's just if you're using this logic but so let's say for example you don't have a, a generational curse of adultery you could theoretically start it by again going back to mike singarelli's example of leaving the door open to a lustful thought and then not closing it and then that would then lead down a whole path of things, basically. And so this is where I think that where people kind of get sucked into this idea. Because, I mean, what we do see biblically... Now, the difference that I would say would be repentant Christian and Christian by name only. But they, they would call it different. But there is a reality that if you if you leave the, if, if you allow lustful thoughts to continue, they will then, I mean, James talks about sin leading into death. So if you allow, um, and, and I'm doing the same thing they're doing because I haven't referenced the verse, but the, um, where he talks about um, the progression of sin in James, I don't have that pulled up, but um, th there is a reality that if you don't, if you allow lustful thoughts to happen, they will progress into something else. And then that, so let's say lustful thoughts progress into pornography addiction and pornography addiction then leads to um, a step up from that where you actually go do it. And then you doing it leads to adultery. And then that adultery affects everybody underneath you. And so um, there are a lot of people, uh, guys, especially that I know that like their dads looked at porn and they saw it on their computer and then they do now. And so th the difference I think is that there is a bit of, of, of a truth to what they're saying and the underlying sense that there are effects on your family from what you do. That's just, I don't, that's not, I mean, that's, that's Christians would say that there are obviously effects on what you, how your sin doesn't just affect you. The step that there seem to be going above and beyond that is attaching things to you then after that, that um, get passed down through your quote unquote bloodline because you did it and it was a horrific sin. And now God has issued a, a penalty for you because of your sin that then gets passed down to your children's children, and your children's children. And so this seems to be the way the thought process works is that there's some sins that um, are not going to affect your, your, your family. And then there are other sins that will, and they all vary by degree. <laughs> um, De uh, hopefully degrees that aren't degrees that aren't going to be defined very well in the scriptures either. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and That's Alexander. Like yeah, go ahead. Alexander seems to have, and he doesn't, I'm sure it's in the book. <laughs> shorts in the book but he doesn't um seem to work it out um here i'm gonna look something up while i'm talking he doesn't seem to work it out fully within this video obviously it's only an hour we're only 25 minutes in oh my goodness um he doesn't seem to work it out fully in this video but he does hint at various sins stubbornness was one of them that definitely leads to a generational curse where are there are some sins that don't lead to generational curses and he bases that entire thought on first john 5 that he quoted way back at the beginning with some sins leading to death and some's not leading to death and the death mm -hmm. as he seems to be defining it is a generational curse that seems to be how he's defining the word death in first john chapter 5 so but, but um, then i would say based on what 
no, know. exactly. Yeah, and it's based on again yeah. this this theory of uh, courtroom of heaven verdict coming down, um, that entire thing. So yeah, mm. yeah, it's, it's very intertwined. Line committing uh, patterns of behavior that are in violation to the courtroom of heaven. Well, the first thing I would say is this: is go into intercession. This is this is this is what I've been teaching. Is the reason why we struggle with concepts of generational curses is because modern evangelicalism has only uh, taught us to view. Real quick, I did look this up. I just want to reference it. So James chapter 1, verse 15 says, After the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. So there is this, this uh, where James talks about, there is a progression here of how sin happens. So I, that's where I think there there's this part where they're, what they're saying and what you're hearing, um, like there's this like, oh, I've, I've kind of heard that before. But um, I think it has to be bared out in in the full context. So in the context that John uh, James is talking about, for example, I mean, you'd have to start back at verse 12, where it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast in a trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say he's be, when he's being tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. This goes back to what you were talking about before, about your own desires, not some random demon mm -hmm. out there. Then the desires, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives, uh, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift, and then he goes into, uh, comes from heaven. So I think, again, some of the things that you hear here, hear here, um, are like, oh, that sounds familiar. But again, without references and reading through them, they can very easily be twisted into something else. So, you Christianity from the place of relationship. We're only thinking relational. I'm here to tell you I'm here, that it's not just relational. You have to think legal. This, this is all. This is all legal. So, this is a, a shift, by the way, in in sort of the topic and how he talks about it. He's shifting from everything we've talked about before with generational curses into the legality of it now. If you're thinking, and it, um, I, I think. The thing about a lot of this, so like they're going to start talking about this word and that word. These are legal terms, legal terms. Legal. Like he's not completely wrong about like there is a, I mean, justification for goodness sakes, right? Like there, there is a sense and like we, we understand and await the final judgment. We're all waiting for that. That's going to happen. So there is a sense in which uh, Christ is the judge. That's even in the Apostles' Creed, right? Like the, the, he's come to judge the living and the dead and uh, we expect that. So he's not wrong about some of these things, but uh, the idea like the courtroom thing and the legal legalities of, of it, like those are concepts that we understand um, and and they are in the scriptures. But the way that the way that he goes about this and the maybe extent of the the uh, doctrine and illustrations that he'll give are like uh, at, at times really far beyond like what the scriptures are actually teaching or uh just he comes that he draws real conclusions that have nothing to do with what the scripture teaches a lot so what well, he'll also and i'll bring it out there's times where he brings out the greek which is good and then there's times where he makes assumptions about the english word that aren't in the greek but he doesn't differentiate the two and it makes it very confusing for the listener so before we go into this let's just all i believe it's a charles spurgeon quote let's just meditate on that for a minute in which he says discernment is being able to identify truth from half truth and i think that's what we're about to get into here where there's a lot of things that do make sense but where like how far do you take those and do they actually mean that so relational you have a problem but if you're thinking legal um then things change let me just kind of throw that out there so so then you go into intercession see when i when, when a christian thinks of intercession they think prayer no the word intercession means pleading that's a courtroom term did you catch what i just said for those of you that are watching the bible says that the widow banged on the door of the unjust judge i'll just say this go look that up and see if jesus is not talking specifically about prayer in that parable just yeah. intercessory no. prayer is a kind of prayer it's not prayer anyway all right like it's not <laughs> Oofta. not wanting answer to prayer but wanting justice mm. that's what you need to do that's why jesus de dedicated a whole parable he said when i come back will the son of man find faith he's not talking about faith in the word he's talking about faith in the heavenly judicial system that's in place and what did the unjust judge said i don't fear god i don't fear man but because this woman troubleth me 
I'm going to see that she get justice, not get an answer to her prayer. And that's what the next verse says, shall not God avenge. Avenge is another courtroom term. Avenge what? Avenge your bloodline and begin to resolve it and revoke. We're just interjecting terms here, guys. That's all we're doing. The issue is... Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 keep going. <laughs> not receiving, it's revoking. Ooh. It's not receiving, it's revoking. It's about revoking. Lord, my bloodline has been into witchcraft. My bloodline has been into divorce. My bloodline has been into dishonor. There's been fraud in my bloodline. Lord, there's been perversion in my bloodline. Lord, give me justice, set me free. Because Lord, I, I did the first part. I crucified the flesh, I'm still dealing with it. I went through multiple deliverance sessions, I'm still dealing with it. Lord, this gotta be a generational curse in my blood. Lord, what did my bloodline do? to be able to initiate the curse. And if you give the courtroom of heaven some time, sometimes the Holy Spirit will give it to you right there. And other times God will send you an answer within a season and begin to speak to you in dreams, begin to speak to you in visions, begin to speak to you with epiphanies and one of those aha moments where out of nowhere, you get an answer and you go, oh my God. Or you're around family members and you hear family members talking about things that happened in the past and the Holy Spirit says, pay attention. And then you realize, oh, that's where the root cause is happening. Or the Holy Spirit will tell you, you did this months ago, or you've been doing this, and this produces a generational curse. Let me give you one that most Christians do, they don't realize that they're doing it, that does produce a generational curse, dishonor. Wow. This, dishonor always. Wow. Yeah, now, wow. here's the thing. So he said a lot there. Again, it was 1.5. I don't, you're just gonna have to go back and listen to it at regular speed if you can take it. There's a lot there in where he talks about the legality of the system. Now, again, as I say with all the, all the sermon reviews, go look at that parable. Yes, Jesus is using a parable about a judge and a widow and the justice system to describe prayer and praying. Like there's, there's a before and after text to that entire parable. Very worth reading because that's important to know. Now he's about to go into this section about honor and dishonor. Now he prefaces this, and this is the, this is like uh, the beautiful part. He prefaces this with generational curses. One that you don't even realize could be honor and dishonor, not showing honor and dishonor. Now specifically the parents, but also just in general. Now in this, he's going to say, this also applies to him as a pastor. He won't say it outright, but he will talk about honoring and dishonoring and listen to you, to, to the authority figures like this. Now, again, half truths here. There is honor and, and, and respect that you should show to your pastor. Obviously, God's put them over you to shepherd you, all of this. Uh, Peter says something about that. But there's this underlying line here that if you disagree with what he's saying, you're dishonor. If you question any of this doctrine that he's talking about, you're dishonoring him and therefore could be putting a generational curse on yourself. So there's this built-in fear. I don't know if it's purposeful. I don't want to assume it is, but there's this fear tactic here that if you question what he's saying and bring dishonor on him by questioning it, then you open yourself up for a generational curse. And that was, it was very interesting to hear this just straight through. So I'm going to try to just let it play unless Rob has something to interject here. But there's this weird, like generational curses can be brought on by dishonor. So don't dishonor me produces a generational curse. This is why there's a reason why the Bible says, touch not my anointed. And the Bible also says, honor your right there father and mother um it's the only commandment uh with a promise which means there's a legal thing going on there here's another way that a christian could produce a generational curse or begin uh to get a case filed against them uh slandering slandering your brother in in their character this is why the bible says if you call someone raka or idiot look what the bible says you are in danger of the court that's what the text says the yeah. text says if you call someone an idiot it actually says it in more modern translation if you call someone an idiot or raka or slander them as a person the bible says you are in danger of the court then the next verse says agree with your adversary because yeah. if you don't, you will be put in prison and won't come out until you pay the last penny. What does that mean for us? Which means you're a Christian, but you're in prison. You're anointed, but you're in prison. Did you catch what I just said? You're yeah. Joseph. Oh. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. No, you're free, but you're still in prison, Joseph. Man, you got me preaching here, man. <laughs> you know no, because here, here's the thing, because we're flowing. Me and you just have this crazy synergy. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 20. This is going to blow some people's minds. Them that sin... It basically says, rebuke them before all. These are talking about Christian leaders that the others may be in fear, the fear of God. As those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that they may, the rest may stand in fear. So here's the thing. And I love what you... Okay, we're going to pause real quick. I just want to read the text that he was referring to as far as being brought in front of a court. Um, I believe if, and again, I, I should probably have looked. Yeah, here it is. This is the text. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Uh -huh. Yeah, is what he's referring to. Rob would know a lot about this. He preached an entire series to the Sermon on the Mount. And so here's the text. You have heard it's, uh, it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, you shall not murder. 
I'm sorry, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, anyone who has anger with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the fire of hell. So if you are offering a gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before you, the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Uh, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you uh, are going while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hands you over to the judge and the judge uh, to the guard and you are put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now, I want to, I want he's, he's trying to make that connection between tort, court and judge to courts of heaven and judgments laid down from the courts of heaven. That's a very important thing to see what's happening here. He's taking Jesus' words on the Sermon on the Mount about uh, anger, forgiveness, and reconciliation, and then trying to put those on top of the theology of the courtroom of heaven in order to say, hey, th this applies in the courtroom of heaven, even though Jesus is teaching on very, uh, very specific uh, murder, anger, re re reconciliation, and the importance of that in the believer's life. And so we're ripping something completely out of context, setting it on top of the theology that he's using here. And again, this he's not the only person that does this. There's a lot of people that do that. With they'll rip verses out of context, put it on top of their theology to make it work. But it's important to see that that's what he's doing here. And that by itself is an enormous red flag. If that's all we had, if that was the only problem, which it's not, but if it was the only problem, that would be huge. Because now we're taking Jesus' words and applying them to something that it has nothing to do with what with Alexander's talking about here. So, any further before we get back into it, Rob? No, oh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay. You're saying there is a uh, what, why is a curse visited upon dishonor? Because we are functioning within a kingdom, which is a judicial system of order, a hierarchy from the, I'm just going to go deep. If you guys want me to go deep, if you want a possible guy to go deep, drop in the comments and tell us. So hierarchy Leave a light. is a word that means from top to bottom. It's a kingdom. That means a king that literally has, it's a, a, a designation of authority, a hierarchy. It's just like in our government, we have in the United States, a president, and then it goes down the line. Now in the same way, and I love what you said, this is why this book is so important for this generation. Y'all better be buying it while I'm still explaining this. Here's the thing, people don't understand curses, and this is what Apostle said, because we've been given the paradigm of relationship, but not governance. It's right. like, we don't understand, like, we, and this is how I always preach it, because we kind of say the same things with different words, which is why I like rocking right. with you, because we always expand our vocabulary. I always preach it, uh, we're not just family, we're royal blood. So right. what happens when you come into adoption is you're not just adopted into a normal family. The, the, the family of heaven is not a middle-class family. You're moving into the kingdom and you become a son of the king. And so, right. you, but you have to understand the, um, the dual nature of the dynamic of that relationship. It's governmental. And it's so hard for us to understand this because we're born into a democracy. We right. vote in a president, we vote right. in the next, but the king is forever. He's come the on. king of all kings. And so what happens is you get adopted into a royal family. And so you have to understand the nature of both these, these relationships. So when I was quoting 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20, you, when you start understanding, like, how can dishonor bring a curse? It's because you are violating a hierarchy. You are now um, basically a rebel or rogue against the government of heaven. Right. You're on earth. You're violating it. And right. so that's why I even tell people, like, if you say, well, I only have a house church and, you know, I am the church and I don't go to church. Well, the ironic thing about that is you're reading a Bible that has at least three layers of leadership represented just in the New Testament epistles. Come on. When you go old covenant, you're still looking at a hierarchy all the way down. And so I love the fact that you connected that to a curse. So I don't want to preach too much because you got me fired up, but people need, I think what happens upon Possible guy. And I want to vindicate and validate you publicly right now. And I want to thank you for installing a full and complete understanding of the scriptures because Billy Graham evangelism gave us relationship. Yes. Well, it's not about religion. It's about relationship. But he filled stadiums, the Jesus revolution. Oh man, Jesus is my friend. Listen, Lord and savior. <laughs> Lord is the language of government. When right. you're the Lord, you are over land, which is dominion and everything right. on it. That's kingdom language. And so what I believe this book is doing, it just looks like there's death in your eyes right now, Rob. You're just dead inside. Uh, what, what, what random thing that I'd be curious to know, and this has nothing to do with this video at all. Are they egalitarian in, in their relationships? That's, that's my curious, like their churches. Are they egalitarian? Because they're talking about hierarchy and how, how hierarchy works and how the scriptures teach of hierarchy and all of this relational stuff. That was a thought that came the other day. I'm like, huh, I wonder if their churches are egalitarian because typically... Pentecostal charismatic churches are not egalitarian or they are egalitarian and they're not uh, complementarian at all. But so we're having this hierarchy language. I wonder how far we that hierarchy language goes. 
thing, and this is why we're doing this broadcast, is trying to help some of you understand you have Constantinian Christianity, you have Billy Graham evangelical uh, relational Christianity, but you don't have governmental Christianity, right. and this is first century. So I don't know if you tag off on that. Well, 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 here's the thing is, is that, you know, most Christians think promises, but heaven thinks legislation. That's just the way that it is. Christians, they're always thinking relationship and promises. God is always thinking law, uh, jurisdiction and legislation. You know, as a matter of fact, okay. God is more legal than he is relational. And I'm going to show you this, even all throughout the Bible. Number one, let's look at this. What does that even... Both the word test... <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Work through it. The... You got a headache. Oh, That's fine. gosh, dude. The, like, God is relational eternally in the Trinity. Like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not saying he's not legal in the way that, I mean, like, of course, this is true. He's judge, jury, executioner, all of these things, right? Yeah. Uh, like Martin Luther famously said that the devil is the is God's devil, right? Uh, like, uh, um and we see that in the book of Job, right? Like the, and, and we understand justification and, and, and uh, all of these actually, yes, legal terms, right? But, um, but to say that God is more legal than relational or that, uh, like that, that, uh, we tend to think promises while heaven thinks legislation. It's like, first of all, like, chapter and verse bro right like you you're not gonna find that anywhere um the best hope that you have for that is to to uh, make your case from observing a whole bunch of scriptures which you're not going to be able to do um the the, the i well, think his... that the very fact that that there's father son holy spirit eternally living in community in perfect union with one another um it puts to bed what he just said and, and that that like some for somehow uh, there's like this legal legislative courtroom kind of thing and it go and it's above in some way the relational aspect of god god is not more one thing than another period that's just tr true of any of the attributes of god god is completely holy he is completely righteous he's not more righteous than he is holy that doesn't make any sense. None of this makes any sense. Okay, I feel better. <laughs> no, you're good. Well, and I think in, in the respect that you were talking, um, uh, even if you look at the scriptures, he relates to, if we're speaking just in Old Testament, to his people in a relational way. You are mine. You are my bride. Um, now, there's a legal aspect in there, but he, he, as far as like, I should, you know, you've divorced me or you have left me or there are like, there are terminologies in that regard. But the entire language is I have taken a people unto myself. I, I, I've, I've, even if we go back to the Ezekiel, I passed you, I made a covenant with you, I, I betrothed you. Like all of these things are relational. I think the point you made there as far as he's not one more thing than the other is a very important point to make there. And I'll just say this just so I can match the energy in this video. Like, oh, so good. All right, let's get back to it. Testament uh, is a legal term. Testament is a legal term. It means a will. So you got old will, Old Testament, New Testament. James says perfect law of liberty. So it actually says he that looks into the perfect law, L-A-W, of liberty. That means deliverance is a constitution. It's a law. There, there, there are laws in play. The term binding and loosing, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth. That word loose means permit, not permit. See, uh, people think permit relationship. Oh, I permit you to be in my life. No, the word loose is permit. Those of us that are, you're a pastor, I'm a pastor. You could build a building, do the best construction in a building, follow all the laws of how to build it right. But if you don't have the permit to build, when the city comes to do an inspection, <laughs> they will make you take it down and tell you, get the permit first, then build. <laughs> so, cool. so this is how the text should be read. Whatever you permit on earth will be permit in the courtroom of heaven. Yeah. Right, the word amen is a legal word. It means so be it. It's not a relational term. It's a legal term. So when we say amen, it's a legal term which means when a decree was released in any kind of uh, courtroom, they would say, amen, so be it. Yeah. Okay, real quick. This is always important. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. There's a couple free apps. When he's talking about what you bind on earth, he's saying what you permit, and then he makes a differentiation between permit as allow versus permit as um, have a legal permit to do this, using legal language. If you actually look up the word bound, um, it's literally to tie, to bind, or to imprison. There's not even a permit in, in that regard, even, even in the Greek, that's not even, it's to impede, 
to hinder, to confine, to bind, to compel. <laughs> like none of these, none of these are the terminology that he's using in regards to a legal permit to in order to build a building. Like that's and that's just by going to Again, there's a couple apps you can do that with. There's the Step Bible app. There's the Literal Word app. You can do that online through the Blue Letter Bible uh, the app. I mean, there's all these sorts of words that you can go to the Greek and actually say, is this what this word means within this context? Because again, the way Greek works, it's highly dependent on where it's in the sentence and what uh, is being implied by the entire building of the sentence in the Greek. And that's just easy to do. So his entire point here is based on the word bound being permit. And if you actually go there, it's not what the word means at all. So now watch this. The Bible actually says, believe in the Lord. You will inherit everlasting life. The word inherit. It doesn't say receive. That's modern translation. King James says inherit everlasting life. Inherit is a legal term. The Bible actually doesn't even call us sons and daughters. Uh, it says sons and daughters of the most high. That's relationship. But it actually says we are citizens of the commonwealth of Israel. As a matter of fact, the Bible even goes a step further. It says where two or three are gathered. That's a legal term. That's a legal requirement for testimony of truth in a courtroom. The Bible says, pronounce judgment at the mouth of two to three witnesses. That's why Jesus said, if two or three agree on earth as touching anything. The Bible also says, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And I'll give you one more just to show your viewers that this whole thing is legal. He whom the sun sets free is free Indeed. No, that's not how it should be read. It's a compound word. It's free in the deed. Okay. And this is where we're mixing English words. This is what I wanted to make sure we pointed out that I talked about before. This is where we're mixing English words with what is being translated. Okay. Now I would encourage you again, this is an hour and 30 minutes already. We're only 36 minutes in. You can look up this verse. I did it yesterday just to verify that, you know, I was right and do the exact same thing we did with bound and permit. And what you're going to find is that he's using the English here to make a point that the Greek itself doesn't. Okay. And th this is, this happens all the time. And it's annoying as all get out, but you were, you were, you were. Yeah. So what, first of all, just to, just so we're on the up and up, the word loosed in those same texts could also be rendered as permit. Um, there you but, go. Glad you double checked that. But um, the uh, to differentiate the action of permitting something and the noun permit that we would go get, like it's it means the same thing. So it it's it's idiotic for him to differentiate those two things. It's like oh go get go buy a permit which permits you to do things right so like it means that there's no reason to differentiate that it's just two different parts of speech depending on how you're going to use it or uh whether it's a noun or a, or a you know a, a verb or whatever um um secondly uh, the what he does here with indeed or in the deed right what you're talking about is the same exact thing that you hear richard Rohr doing with atonement at one mint which is just stupid. I mean, you have to be mentally unstable to buy into that. Like so blinded that you can't even read and understand the English language. And certainly that you can't understand the fact that like atonement, like there's probably a Greek Hebrew word that we translate as atonement that you can't do that to right? Atonement is its own word. It means something and it doesn't mean at one minute, right? Um, in the same way that indeed can't just be like, like you can't just grab a butcher knife and jack that up and, and change it into something it doesn't mean, right? So what he's doing here is I think one of the most blatant things that he does the whole time. A lot of what can be done or a lot of what he's done uh, could could possibly be done by someone who is just um, really deceived themselves or has come to believe a bunch of these things through other people or whatever, right? But what he's doing here is it like, this doesn't even make any sense. 
to change the English word to mean something else. It doesn't do anything. Uh, the one who uh, um, he sets free is free indeed. The one who the son sets free is free indeed. Um, uh, you, it doesn't, uh, I mean, you could make a, a correlation to maybe like what we owed, right? Um, and, and that kind of thing. But, um, but to, to like, I would never get up behind the pulpit and read that verse and then make some kind of point about in the deed, right? Like that, that's, you're, you're, you're butchering the English translation of what was Greek. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things, and I'll say this and we'll get right back into it because we're only halfway through the video yeah, is, <laughs> is that, um, Hey, this is the same thing that happens with the sermon reviews. I'm like, Hey, this will be short an hour and a half yes. later. So, um, <clears throat> but I, it's important to break this stuff down. And this feeds into the point that I was going to say before we get back into the video, it's really easy to get caught up in what is being said it to the point that you don't even question if it's right or not. And that this happens with everyone. I mean, this there's lots of you know pastors that people listen to all the time that are very dynamic speakers and are very good communicators. And in in getting caught up in what they say in some of their good points, when they say the bad ones, you don't even see it because you've already said, oh, this is all good, this is all great. And so when somebody comes across, it, you know, free in the deed, you're just already in the momentum of the moment of listening that you just go through it and you're not thinking about it and you're not processing what's actually being said. And I think that's sometimes what happens with, uh, my guess is Alexander is probably pretty good at communicating. And so whenever that happens, you just get caught up and keep going because you're like, well, everything else is, I've, you know, has been right. So this has to be as well. Yeah. In the deed, which means those of you that are homeowners understand what it means, the title deed, not indeed relationship. Amen. We can do that. That makes good preaching, right? But the text says, he whom the son sets free is free in the deed, which means even if I don't feel like it, the deed he on the paperwork the here says. It's do what? I just, he just said the text says. Yeah. And in, said, the in the deed. Which yeah. it actually doesn't say. Yeah. It's my name on it. I have my right to be free. So what we're trying to do and the whole concept of generational curses is predicated upon the legislation that Christians are still to abide by because not only are we a chosen people relationship, we are a royal priesthood legislation. See how that works? So it's royal, which means there are rules and regulations in the courtroom and then priesthood, there are rules and regulations in the tabernacle. So it's all mixed in there. This is why, yes, a Christian can be spirit filled and still dealing with a generational curse because they have violated either through ignorance or willful disobedience, the legislation of the courtroom of heaven, and depending on the infraction or the transgression committed, will depend on the level of penalty of judgment. Robbery in the first degree, robbery in the second degree, robbery in the third degree. Okay, so if I get a lustful thought, I'm not gonna get cursed by it. But if I live in fornication, I will open my door to a generational curse of fornication. Man, you got me preaching here, I'm getting excited, man. Now, listen, you know, and I wanna say to everybody watching right now, Apostle Pagani is actually not teaching anything new. He's reinstalling something that got deleted out of the conversation, that got deleted from the pulpit because preachers preach to their preferences. Preachers mm -hmm. preach towards their own personal, you know, their, their, their own opinion. So this is not, for many of you watching right now, we're thinking, oh, this is a new revelation. This is a first century, normal, institutionalized. They would have all understood it. They, in, you know, Roman occupied, first century Jewish being converted to Christianity. They understood law. This was normal to them. That's why Jesus spoke this language. So I just want to step back because I feel like there's some people who are like, man, this is a new revelation. No, he is simply reinstalling something that got lost in denominationalism. It got lost. Like I mentioned, Constant, Constantine showed up, made a government sanctioned version of Christianity called Roman Catholicism. Okay. I got to stop. So ask any church historian, <laughs> you know, lit, lit, any of them, you can go, go follow, uh, man, I don't even got their names on here, man. Just go any church historian. Yeah. Nick Needham's great at this. Um, he, I don't want to say he doesn't know because maybe he does. I am never going to claim to be, you know, a church historian that knows all that it knows. I, I, I'm not going to claim that. But I've done enough to know that he, Constantine did not install Roman Catholicism. This schism happens later. This, it, this is far down the line from Constantine in regards to even why this happens. Um, Wes Huff, that's his name. You can go follow Wes Huff on Instagram. Um, Wes is really good, not just about church history, but about like documentation during church history. Uh, he goes through a bunch of different manuscripts. He's real good on it. Um, that's just one really accessible guy. Uh, but the, the, 
the idea that Constantine installed Roman Catholicism is a joke. It's just, it just is a joke. The idea that this teaching got deleted at apparently Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea, apparently, uh, is, is insane. Um, you can look up, there are accessible writings from early church fathers before the Council of uh, Nicaea. So you can look up Tertullian, Clement of Rome. Those are two specifically. There's more, obviously. Um, they did write. I mean, there, there has to be an admission to the, the reality that they did write about demons and demons, uh, demon possession and people being freed from demons at the name of Jesus. That's just the reality of the fact. You can work through that. You can process through that however you'd like, but the reality is they did write about it. Now, the interesting thing about that, at least of everything I've written, let me know in the comment section if, if, if I'm missing something or if you have an actual citation from a, from a original source. But all of the demonology they talk about is, is uh, before baptism and conversion. Right, so at, at at baptism, you would recite the Apostles' Creed. The, at the end of the Apostles' Creed, you would say, "I renounce Satan and all of his works," which is saying that I am now Jesus's and I am no longer following the things of Satan. And at sometimes, not all the time, not even all the time, even, but sometimes they record people at baptism being freed from demons at the name of Jesus. Just the thing they record. Do with what you want with that. But there is nothing, and you would have to. I mean, I need like in print documentation that any of these church fathers before Constantine say that generational curses and courtrooms of heaven and all of this thing that he's built out is a thing. You're not going to find, you're not going to find it. You're just not. So this is a bold claim, my friend. This is a super bold claim that this has been deleted and somehow Constantine brought forth the Roman Catholicism and this all this re, just this nonsense this rewriting of history is just blatant I, i'm done i think i think too really important i knew you were going to stop it there because I, I knew you weren't going to be able to take it but um uh, another thing that he said there that i think is uh important and and the people who are going to be typically like that who are going to subscribe to this guy's channel um and who listen to uh Bagani, um regularly and and these kinds of things um are are going to be familiar with uh and probably already sort of inundated with uh what um what mike is saying um and uh when it comes to uh new revelation that he talked about uh he he's he says uh some of you are are like oh this is new revelation but it's not and then he he goes into his stuff that michael was just talking about but uh but it new revelation is not a thing i think that's important <laughs> for us to for us to talk about too that's a that's a big thing in um in that movement uh is new revelation god speaks to me and um and yeah only when you're reading the bible right like <laughs> like that is god's revelation so um god isn't uh, now i'm not i'm not going to say that that uh the the holy spirit that's living in you doesn't prompt you in some way to uh, like you notice uh, there's a guy over here who looks broke and uh, I just got this food. So here you go. Like uh, you, you noticing that and fi and feeling like, okay, I, I need to do this. Uh, I'm not saying that God doesn't uh, uh, move in your life and doesn't uh, prompt you to do things like that or whatever. Um, but what I am saying is anytime you hear new and revelation in the same phrase, like you need to put a big fat beware on uh, like you need to put that in your lenses right away. Right. Because new revelation isn't a thing. And that's what that is a major deal in this like apostle Pagani sort of ide ideology. Like as an apostle, he can say and do the things that he's doing with the text and no one's going to question it because touch not the Lord's anointed, which is also a butchering of that text. Right. So, um, uh, he, he doesn't have the authority to do that. Um, the, the, the most authority that he or uh, Mike or uh, the honest youth pastor or uh, me or what the only authority that we have would would come from the scriptures in context, exegetical, not I. What does your hat say again? Um, like that's yeah, exegesis that's how, over eisegesis. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how it's done. That's this is 
this is the revelation. And so if there's something new out there that's revelation, I like what Lawson always says, if it's new, it's not true. <laughs> um, and that's that's about the truth of the matter. So beware with that new revelation junk. All right, let's go. We're, I mean, we're, we're 40. We only got 20 minutes left, Rob. 20 minutes at 1.5. So it's faster. And you just all this stuff. So a lot of what we are doing is retracing ancient paths and saying, let me recontextualize what real quick retracing ancient paths. So I'll be honest with you, like I would love to see citation. So he's he's nodding along. Yes, this is this is this is pre Constantinian Christianity. Fine. Cite that in your book. Give me original sources for the claims from early church fathers on, on any of this what they decontextualize. Let me let me help you understand what it really meant, not what you got in westernized modern Christianity. If you're thankful for that, smash that thumbs up right now. I'm going to add a little bit and I, I got a question connected to this. But think about this. In the beginning was the word. That's that's legal talk. Why? Because we have a written constitution in the American in the US government, but when you have a king, the king's word is the law. Whatever proceeds out of his mouth is it's so in the beginning was the word. You I hear that legally. And so when Jesus the words the word is Jesus Jesus is at the beginning. Jesus showed up. What gave him authority is as God's only begotten son. There's a delegation of authority. He's 100% God. He's now speaking through that 100% man. And he's demonstrating for us dominion, which is also a legal term. I will give you authority. <laughs> I will, you know, it's, let me just say this, and I think this is a really good example. And I, I preached this at the deliverance conference recently, but I have two daughters when they were arguing over who gets to play with which toy. One daughter came to me and said, you know, she's not sharing. I said, you go back upstairs and you tell Everly, I said she has to share the toy. Well, that's a delegation of authority. I'm the priest of my home. I leave, I'm over my children in a hierarchy. And so when my daughter told the other daughter, dad said. That was the other thing. Are you over your wife in a hierarchy? Do you lead her? Or no, does that not count? So it, she is a recipient of my authority. So look, it's both relationship and hierarchy. It's both right. of them. And so then, and so guess what? My daughter didn't obey my other daughter. My daughter obeyed uh, me through my daughter. So, it, so when you tell a demon come out, they're not obeying you. They're obeying the jurisdiction, the authority of the courtroom of heaven through your father. And they're saying, I I'm, I'm listening to the one who gave the authority through them. But it's both. It's relationship through hierarchy. So let me ask you this. Because I know we've been going for almost an hour and I'm so thankful for your time. But what now, how does this affect deliverance? Like, how, how does a curse interact with a demon? You okay. know, yeah, maybe talk about that. I know that's basic for some people, but how does this interact with deliverance? Okay, first and foremost, let's establish that a generational curse and a demon, they're not the same thing. Yeah. Demons are the enforcers of the curse, not the initiators of it. Mm. Demons can't impose a curse on someone unless they have the legal right to do so. They carry out, the demons carry out the judgment that the courtroom of heaven has sanctioned. That's their... Now, real quick, he doesn't get into this, but I do want to clarify because of all the videos I've watched, this seems to be the logic here is that you'll hear people talk in this in this sort of category, talk about that you've opened yourself up to the legal right for a demon to do something to you. So in another video, for example, they were talking about soul ties, which is a totally different subject that we're not going to get into today. But the idea is that if you are to sleep with someone that has a demon, because you've slept with that person with the demon, that demon now has legal right over you and to torment you. And this goes back to the same language, this legal right that he's talking about. So the demons then enforce the curse because they have the legal right to do so. And again, that's just to, sh just to show kind of the working out of this language. There's a lot of legality involved here <clears throat> and who has the right and who doesn't have the right. So you'll also see videos where somebody will cast out a demon and says, you no longer have legal right here in this person. And that's that language taking play as well. This legality of who has legal right and who doesn't and who has the authority and all of that. Current role when it comes to this, they don't initiate it. Now, does the kingdom of darkness uh, put hexes and curses on people? Obviously, I kind of get into that. You got Satanism, uh, people that are into the occult, sending curses on people. That's another level of sending a curse coming from the kingdom of darkness. But initially, when it comes into the life of the believer, they are not the initiators of the curse. They are the enforcers of the curse. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't initiate it. So I think the believer needs to kind of understand uh, the difference uh, between the two. Now, this is how it started for me. I'm going to tell you why I wrote this book because I got, and, and Pastor Mike, you okay, hold on. You're thinking, go ahead. So if Dean, I'm, I'm trying, maybe because you've looked into this more than me, but if demons are the enforcers of the curse, which is, it sounds like that's what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. Yeah. Okay, so if demons are the enforcers of the curse, then after your deliverance and there's no more demon, why is the curse still around? And why are you still living under the curse? Because the enforcer is gone. 
I, like that, that I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer for that. It's a good point. Yeah, I don't know. That doesn't click either for me, right? Like, doesn't that kind of seem like because the whole case he was making at the beginning or towards if the you're beginning delivered, is, yeah, it's like these are the levels, right? Like you, you, oh, you've done the deliverance thing a couple times, and and so the, it's not the demons because they're not there. Uh, now it's, oh, it must be a generational curse. Well, who's enforcing the generational curse then? If the demon is the enforcer of the curse and it's gone. I don't know. That's, that's good. Uh, just I, that's, saying. That, that seems man. like a hole to me. <laughs> yeah, because he doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't answer that here. That's a good point, though. You can agree with me on this. I got sick and tired of taking the same people through deliverance. Mm. I got frustrated with taking the same person over and over and over and over again. And amen, those of you that need multiple deliverances, I'm telling you, go for it. Mm. But I begin to question, uh, what went wrong with, the, with their last deliverance that here they are on my line again in my church, and this is like their sixth deliverance session. So I begin to question, what if- It's like pastors that are like, didn't you get saved last week? Why are you back? <laughs> Am I doing mm. wrong? Yeah, and what are they doing wrong? Not real, buddy. That was where the thought came to me of, God, what is going on? Either deliverance works or it doesn't or it doesn't work. So I began to entertain the idea of maybe there's some deliverance idolatry going on and deliverance addiction. And yes, there's a place for that. And, yes. uh, and Christians need to get delivered from uh, deliverance addiction. It's about Christ, not deliverance, you know. But I began to say, Lord, what am I doing wrong or what are they doing wrong? And I heard the Holy Spirit say, none of you are doing anything wrong. This is not a demon issue. This is a generational curse issue. Wow. So see, no, he, he fills the hole in by saying the Spirit told me this. Apparently, that, that's how the hole seems to be filled in. Because he see, he seems to see that, hey, this doesn't, like, they're still here, and the demons are gone, and then the Holy Spirit tells him, or the so-called Holy Spirit tells him um, that it's a curse issue, even though the demon's gone. So there's... Yeah, some kind of spirit, maybe, but probably not the Holy That's, One. It was just a simple thought, generational curse, and then... Isaiah 58 came into mind. Mm. This is, is not this the fast that I have chosen. And then it says this, to loose the bands of wickedness. Wow. Which means that this particular pattern of behavior, it's like a rope that's tied around them. And they need to be loosed from it. Notice that the text doesn't say, get deliverance from the bands, uh, uh, get deliverance, uh, yeah, yeah. stop wickedness. It says, get loosened from it. So I said, okay, God. And it began a five-year journey. This book is the result of five years. This book was supposed to come out a year after this book. So this book has been out since 2018 by God's grace and secrets of deliverance, which we're going to give away. We made our 500 subs. We're going to give you a link that you can download it. All right. So um, in a little bit, um, this book was supposed to come out a year after that book. And I just felt it, I wasn't ready for it. I, I wasn't ready. God was still showing me stuff. So this book is five and a half years, almost six years for its part two. And it was because I, I began to question, okay, God, why is there such a epidemic of deliverance addiction and deliverance idolatry going on that the heresy hunters are picking up on that? Because no one, you and I, you know, the heresy hunters are picking up on the fact that there's so many deliverances and no one's being delivered. <laughs> okay. Um, Perhaps they've found heresy in different places. I don't know. So, so here's Isaiah 58. I just, again, I always want to go back to the text guys, just to, just to make this make sense. Um, so 58, he's actually talking about verse six. Now he didn't tell us that I had mm -hmm. to Google it, but it's verse six. There's a whole lot before that, but I'm just going to read it real quick. And we'll just, so we all, the, I, cause I don't know, I don't know the context of this, but I'm guarantee you it's not what he's talking about. So it says, cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voices like a, a, a turnip declare to, or like a trumpet, not a turnip. Sorry. Declare to my people <laughs> their transgression. I thought that was a weird Turn it. I was like, why is there a tournament? A turn anyway, sorry. Declare to my people their transgressions, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask me, they ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to the Lord. Why have we fasted and not seen? Why have we humbled ourselves and you not take knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and, upset and uh, oppress all your workers. Behold, the fast only uh, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with the wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. Uh, verse five is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself. That's in question form. Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? You will call this a fast 
uh, and a day acceptable to the Lord. And then this is the verse he's referencing. Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness and to undo the straps of your yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your home when you see them naked and to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? And then he keeps going on. So first of all, this has nothing to do with generational curses. This is the Israelites. Uh, I mean, I just feel like that has to be said. Um, the, but this is this is all about them fasting, doing it incorrectly, doing it in ways that aren't the way he's asked, and then still thinking that he's going to give them uh, things the way that he's promised, even though they're doing it incorrectly. And so, and then verse six is actually an intro into this is what you should be doing. Not, not, this is the way that God has bound and loose things that, I mean, do you see how just reading context solves all of these problems? Every single, like you, you're never, ever going to get to the place that Picati got to. If you read all of it, even if you just read verse six, you're not going to get there. Yeah. I think, I think it's, it's really important because of uh, like so many of the ideologies that bleed into the church today um, have this same issue at, at heart. And that is that we, we put lenses on and then read the text through those lenses. Now, to be fair, every human that has ever read the Bible does this. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and the great task of, of the Christian who's studying the scriptures, the great task is, is removing those lenses and putting, in this case, the lenses on that Isaiah had, right? Or what exactly is Isaiah saying in that, in that geographical context, uh, historical context, governmental context, whatever, uh, uh, spiritual, uh, whatever, all of the things that you can do to attempt to, to understand what Isaiah meant by what Isaiah said, and chiefly what God meant by putting in Isaiah what, what was stated. Um, whatever I can do to, to find that, that is the great task of Bible study. And so the, the thing that we all have to strive to do is to take the lenses that we come with off and put the lenses of the writers on. And, uh, and, and I think that's how we come away with, um, that's how we come away with this, with so much of what he's doing, because like we've witnessed over and over and over again throughout this whole video, him doing that. He, he's got his framework that he's already got here, right? And he takes that framework and imposes it on the scriptures. And so you wind up with Isaiah 58, 6, meaning something that it was never meant to mean. It has nothing to do with it. What's going on in this text, like you said, is really the same thing that goes on in a lot of texts, um, is that they weren't circumcised at heart. Uh, God elsewhere says to them, like, I, I abhor your sacrifice. The very things that that he told them they have to do to serve him, he abhors them because they're not doing them the right way. They, they don't have the heart. They're not actually meaning anything. Um, and that's what's going on here. Like, it's not it's really not rocket science if you just look at it in the context. But if I come to it uh, with my own lenses, this is how we get critical race theory seeping into the church and everything else um, that that is so uh, destructive. This is how it this always is, happens. This is how we get Jonathan and David in a uh, in a lover relationship. Yeah, all yes. of these things. Yeah, I I come with my preconceived notions, with my presuppositions. Um, and and I, I won't acknowledge that I might have presuppositions. Um, I'm not coming at the text saying, Lord, please uh, show me my presuppositions and and help get those out of the way. Um, I, I think uh, this is one of the great problems, right? Bible study, um, correct Bible study requires of us that we are attempt understanding that it's true and then attempting to get the lenses that we bring off so that we can see through the lenses that that 
Paul was wearing when he wrote this or that, or Peter or Isaiah in this case, or, or whatever. That's the great task. And you, these guys both have lenses that they've put on through which to read a whole all of the scriptures. And so it's no wonder that they're taking things that don't mean anything like this and making them mean things that they don't mean. <laughs> well, and the the weird thing... And again, like you said, we've all at some point been guilty of this. The idea of understanding that you have those lenses is is wonderful and saying what got me to this point, right? Like there there are at least seven different sort of eras in history that have added or went back and forth on biblical interpretation and, you know, either been beneficial or terribly hurtful to actual hermeneutics. But they don't seem to understand that because he, he thinks, at least Mike thinks, that he's operating out of a pre-Constantinian first, second century lens. I mean, that he, he's already said that. He's all of these. I mean, so he knows there's lenses, but he, he thinks that he's operating, uh, and I would say ignorantly, just and not like he's dumb, but just ignorantly not knowing the knowledge. Because him saying that Constantine brought in Roman Catholicism is just clearly uneducated in the regard. But he doesn't think he's seen it through lenses basically also the way i've paused it he looks like he's glaring at us so let's keep going <laughs> you and i know that we don't have deliverance idolatry as a matter of fact to get us to blame it on a demon it takes a lot because we troubleshoot the flesh we troubleshoot whether irresponsibility personal responsibility we tell people submit to god resist the devil and the devil will flee which is preventative uh measure of freedom by the time we get to deliverance you and i and isaiah and the demon slayers that's like the last thing that we do okay this is obviously a demon at this point and we take them through deliverance see i'll call a big old flag on that play because they have mass deliverances. I mean, they host mass deliverance nights. So if you're actually vetting all of these people and deliverance is the last thing you're trying to do, the last event you're holding is a deliverance event, unless you vetted every single one of those people. So I call big old flag on the play on that one. I don't believe you. So I began to question and I began to explore the idea of this might not be a person issue, uh, or a being issue, this might be a bloodline issue. Wow. So I said, hey God, this might be a bloodline issue. And I began to look through the scriptures and I began to see it all over in the New Testament. And let me just throw this out there. Yes. And he just admitted to what you said about he he's thinking, oh, this is a bloodline issue. Now let me go to the text. So he's going to the text with the preconceived notion that this has to be there. Generational curses is in the epistles. Now I know that's a that's a shocker for many of you, but let me show it, let me let me show it to you. Uh first John chapter one. Verse seven says, if you confess your sins, right? He is faithful. Notice how that verse, we've been talking about oh. it leading up to this point. We've been saying it's not just relational, it's legislative as well. It's legal, right? Watch this, watch this. The Bible says, if you confess your sins, the word confess is not tell. That's a legal term. The word confess is another legal term. You only confess in a courtroom. What if I tell a person, no, that's telling someone. It doesn't say tell your faults to one another. It says confess your faults to one another. So it says this, if you confess your sins, he is faithful, relationship, and just, legal. To forgive you of your sins, relationship, and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness, generational curse. Let me let me let me say it again. Let me say it again. If you can. <laughs> so, so, you go first. I, well, I was just gonna say, like, at the end of this whole thing, I want to talk really briefly about okay. what a generational curse is in the scriptures. Okay. Um, because it it actually uh, obliterates everything that he has said about generational curse. Like his entire book could be part of a Nazi book burning and it would be fine because everything that he said about generational curse curses thus far has been fabrication from whatever lenses he's bringing to the scriptures. Generational curses uh, are, well, we can maybe get into that at the end. Well, just yeah, really we'll briefly. To, yeah. But this sure. is, he's, he has uh, again done what we've just been talking about. Uh, like, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is, um, forgive us our sins is initial, right? Like uh, salvation, uh, cleanse us from all unrighteousness is sanctification. This is, this is what it's talking about. It has nothing to do with any curse except perhaps the, 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 uh, learning to submit to Christ and and increasingly to not be under the curse of Adam, right? But if we're talking about generational curses, it's not, this has nothing to do with that. Nothing. 
Yeah, the only thing I was going to say uh, was that he had mentioned First John 5, and then he skips over to James without telling us at all, as he's mentioning confession uh, as a legal term, even though they're confessing to one another um, in, in, a, in a body to hold each other accountable, to bring forth discipleship and sanctification. So let's go. Confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin, but to also cleanse you of the curse that's empowering that wickedness and causing you to sin. It's hidden right there. Most Honestly. evangelical. <laughs> it's also hidden. Uh, it's the hidden curse there. is what is causing you to sin. Could possibly be that you're just a, a sinner and you're, you're working on that and you're attempting to right? Like John Owen, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Like that there's that war that's going on, right? It couldn't possibly be that you just have fleshly desires still that need to be put continuously put to death. Um, that, that couldn't be it. It's the curse that's causing you to sin. That's, uh, at best really sloppy and at worst telling to, to everything that, <laughs> that he's well, and you wonder why people are in a line every week. See, that's the crazy part. You wonder why people are in a line every week, but you're giving them at nauseum reasons to doubt like if they're saved because they've either got a curse or they've got a demon and it's not just one curse or demon like in this this idea you could open yourself up to a number of curses and demons and maybe you haven't even done it you've been passed down to so now now you're operating with an untold number of curses and demons that you feel like you constantly have to be delivered or freed from and jesus's cross isn't enough he's already said that because just because you're saved doesn't mean you're set free from any of this stuff you are free you're a free man living in chains is what they've said a number of times like it's just it's an asinine way to see things, given the fact that in the scriptures, we see that, uh, that yes, you are going to struggle with sin. That is sanctification. But it is a repentant believer in community with others, with the Holy Spirit working you through that process, making you more like Jesus. Like, you're not going to be free from it. Like, if you're in a line all the time, you're like, well, I just want to be free from sin totally. Wait till glorification, my brother or sister, because that is the only time that is going to happen. Um, but, oh. But don't worry, it's hidden. Yeah. It's hidden there in the text. You just, you can't see it, but the apostle can. So just listen to the apostle. Don't don't speak badly about God, God's anointed because if you do, that's slander, and now you're bringing a curse on yourself. So just just listen and take in. Stop at forgive us of our sin and keep walking. No, it says and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is a legal term. Notice how the verse doesn't start off saying if you confess your unrighteousness. <laughs> and I'm preaching. You got me preaching here, Pastor Mike. Oh. It doesn't say if you confess your, your unrighteousness. He, no, it says if you confess your sin. He is faithful and just. Relational. He's your father and just. He's your judge. To forgive you of your sin through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus' work on the cross, blood of Jesus. But then it also says this. To cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Break the generational curse that's empowering this. That sin. Now watch this. That verse is not written to unbelievers. Yeah. That verse is written to Christians. You know how I know? Because the chapter starts off by saying, I write unto you, little children. We skip back into John now, in case anybody's wondering, First John. Uh, it says, I write unto you, little children. <laughs> so it's not talking about unbelievers. It's talking about believers. And if you're watching me right now, if you have passed a submission test and things are still acting up, it's a demon. If you got deliverance and you got rid of the demon and the area is still acting up, you're dealing with a generational curse. But I'm here to tell you the curse breaker, Jesus, and the work that he did on the cross is available. The efficacy of Christ's work on the cross, Christ crucified, what he did on the cross is available to not just forgive you of your sin, First John chapter 2, verse, verse 1, he's the propitiation for our sin. But not only that, the curse-breaking power of the Holy Ghost is here to cleanse you. Cleanse what? That's a bloodline issue. Cleanse me from what? See, he was going well there for a second. We're talking about Jesus, talking about the Holy Spirit. We were doing great. And then we right back into bloodline. Bloodline kicking about in your own blood and no one. Yeah. No, no, I'm just, oh, I'm your just praising and worshiping oh, him. Oh, I'm like sorry, I'm sorry, I, inter I interrupted you. Washed you. It's yeah. available for you right now, and all you have to do is not pray to the courtroom. No. You plead to the courtroom through your intercessor. Who is who? Jesus, the intercessor. For he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Wait, 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 wait. It doesn't say he ever lived to make prayers for us. Nope. Intercession is a legal term. <laughs> Your high priest, Jesus, is the curse breaker. He ever lived to 
plead for your bloodline in your life active and set we're adding a lot a lot to this you free from mm. what is keeping you bound by a generational curse and you can do that right now as a matter of fact i want you to write it in the chat room lord jesus set me free from the curse go ahead and write it in the chat room. go ahead and write it, write it in the chat room right now so that you can begin the process so you might be asking how does it begin right now by banging or or pleading for mercy at the court that's what it means applying mercy in the courtroom oh where mercy seat in the courtroom uh, go through jesus to god right now and say lord i'm dealing with a curse write it down on a piece of paper and god will begin to reveal it to you and then i want to encourage you after you did all of that okay we've been going for so long this headphone is now dead so now i'm down to one so now we're gonna go to hebrews where he talks where where he's actually drawing this verse from okay so hebrews chapter 7 we're gonna start at verse 23 even though we could technically go before that the former priests were many in number because they were prevented uh, prevented by death from continuing in the office but he holds his priesthood permanently jesus because he continues forever Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he is all since he always lives to make intercession for them. So, his whole point is the previous priest, they died, they couldn't completely, they couldn't keep going into the temple over and over and over again. Right? Again, you've already referenced this. This is a very Jewish. This is a Jewish sermon, essentially. Hebrews is, and so he's making a point. The old priest couldn't keep doing the intercession, but you now you do have a priest that makes continual intercession for you. And so you have to inter understand, again, within the context, he's the, he, the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, Jesus is like the old priest that used to go in and make intercession for you before the Lord. However, you have a priest that always does that for you now. Jesus is the better high priest that does this for you. And so, again, completely inoculates against this idea uh, of what he's saying in this courtroom sense, because the writer of Hebrews from the verse he quotes isn't talking about a courtroom sense. He's talking about the priestly system set up by God in which they would go before God and intercede for the people for their sins. And now Jesus is the better high priest that does that for you continuously before the throne. There's a lot more in that, but the point is that's not, it's, it's not what he's using the verse for. So <sighs> eight minutes, eight minutes. That, you want confirmation on what God told you? You need to go get this book, The Secrets to Deliverance. As a matter of fact, it's pinned in the comment, both on YouTube and Facebook. But what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give you a free ebook copy uh, just for this broadcast for a couple of hours, a free ebook copy of my book, The Secrets to... It's like Joseph Smith. You need to get the, the Golden Tablet translation uh, because you don't fully get what's going on here until you do that. Deliverance because you have subscribed for 500 people right now in Jesus name. Mike, I'm fired up. I'm uh, fired up. Put the link in the chat room right on, now. Spam in that chat. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want you, somebody needs to get a revelation of this because people are coming up under the power of God. I just felt such a release of freedom. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, that is a legal language in and of itself. It's saying it's not just about me, it's about my household as well. And so when you begin to deal in the area of generational curses, you're saying, as for me and my house, you Come know, on. you're normalizing the things that we do in deliverance. When we get together in a group and we all start confessing, I'm confessing on behalf of the Signorelli line, lust, perversion, murder, you begin to go through that, Lord, I'm pleading the blood of Jesus. Doesn't that phrase make more sense? I'm pleading that the blood would wash me. This is a legal exchange. And as for me and my house, it may run in my family, but I am where it runs out. We're not going to transmit these things to our children. And so these broadcasts, I'm telling you, it's not just about, oh, oh, I get it. We're trying to sell books. No, we are trying to give you the legal language to begin to deal with some things that the language of relationship in Christianity did not equip you to deal with. Come we are on. trying to give you, matter of fact, I was laughing because I said, I want to hold the book up during the broadcast. Julie, where is my book? The Secrets to Generational Curses. And Julie said, I got it. And it's with me. And she's on the other side of town right now. So the sick <laughs> fight over this book. I got to buy another one. <laughs> so this is what it looks like. So right now my wife and I, are, because why? It's possible to be saved, but still be in chains. It's possible to be saved, but still have curses that you're dealing with. Repeated behaviors, patterns of behavior that show up in the form of curse. You know, it's possible for you to be saved, and yet there are demons in you that are enforcing that curse. I want to say this because we're coming to a close. We've been on for an hour, and I'm so thankful. But think about this. You know, Saul Me is too. vexed by demons. And if you go back and read those scriptures, it actually says, and he was visited by those demons from the Lord. And when people are new to all this Apostle Gandhi, they're always freaked out by the idea that, wait a second. And, their vis and Saul, the king of Israel, was visited by demons and the Lord sent them? Yes, that's legal. And, and it's legal, why? Because he's a just God. And now, what, now what, let, me, let me interject because you got me fired up with what you just said. 
This is why God told Samuel, stop pleading for him. Yes, yes. The text says, what was Samuel doing? He was interceding on Saul's behalf. And what did God say? Stop interceding for him. Stop pleading for him in the courtroom. I have rejected him, which means the decree is already out. He's rejected yep. his kingdom. I'm giving to another. Yep. That whole thing of Samuel and God telling Samuel to stop praying. It wasn't because of relationship. God loves Saul. God loves yep. Saul. He loves Saul. It was a legal moment. This is why, watch this. Even David understood legalities when he sinned with Bathsheba concerning the baby. Yeah, yes. What did he do? He told the, he told the servants, I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray. Perhaps God will change his mind. Yeah. Where? In the courtroom. So David was interceding in the courtroom. Let me give you another one. When God told Hezekiah, you're going to die in three days, get your house in order. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and pleaded before the courtroom. And before Isaiah left the palace, Isaiah had to go back and tell him, God has heard your supplication in the courtroom. And God sent a new decree. And God says, the three days have been extended to 15 years. And I want to tell somebody that's watching me right now, don't cut your destiny short. Don't cut your blessing short. Don't cut what God has called you to do short because of this present day curse that's activated in in your life, plead before the courtroom of heaven right now. And I promise you, God will send another decree, another law, and a greater law will trump out the lesser law. And God will shift and turn your bloodline around. You don't have to die in your sin. You don't have to lose anything. As a matter of fact, God says, if I break the curse over your life, I will restore. You know what that word restore means? Yeah, come on with it's it. It's a legal term. It's not relationship. It's a legal term. It means restitution. Restitution is a legal term. It means yeah. I will restitute the years that the canker worm has eaten. Mm. It's all legal. It's yeah. all legal. Get set free now in the name of Jesus. And then I want you to go out. The link is pinned in the comment. After this broadcast, go and pick up this book and buy two. One for you and one for somebody that you know that probably won't buy the book because they have stigma concerning curses and deliverance. You buy it and I want you to give it to your pastor as a gift. Give it to them in love. Say, Pastor, I bought a gift for you. I got this really... If somebody walks up to me and goes, hey, I bought you this book, I'm going to be like, cool, we need to talk. I'm going to read it, but we need, we probably need to talk. The book, I thought I'd give it to you. Now, don't force it on your pastor and don't throw it at your pastor and say, you need to read this book and get delivered. No, don't do that. Honor your pastor and say, pastor, I bought this book that I think it would be a blessing to you. You can read it. And I want you to buy it and make sure you get it into the hand of everyone. Make sure as we close out, the link for you to download the free ebook copy just for a couple of hours and then it's not activated anymore. You could download it. I already put it in the chat room. But here's what I want you to do. If you were blessed by everything that I shared today, all I'm asking is this, is follow me on YouTube. We're almost we're at the 99,000 something. We're almost at the cusp of 100K and I want you to follow me. So I'm going to put the link again in the chat room and I want you to make sure that you subscribe to us. Pastor Mike, thank you. Oh, thank so you good. for having me on. Me and you can tag team preach like none other. I, I got to like try to stop myself because I'm thinking about Hebrews chapter four, verse 16. Come boldly before the throne. Of grace. That's you big language. Should. Come boldly. Hey, hey, the good news is, oh, I mean, the good news, not for him, but um, he's lost subscribers since this video was made. So, Oh, he's really? Only, yeah, he's only 98.5. He said he was on the cusp of 90, 99. So he's lost a few, apparently boldly before the throne of grace. It's you got to come before the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find Ooh. grace. And so it's like, whew, so you go. Mercy is, legal. mercy is legal. Grace is relational. It's there. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Now I want to say something because I got, I got something that dropped in my spirit. And I don't know if anybody's ever told you this before. It's not just about you going number one because you've gone number one repeatedly. I believe there are certain ministers that God gives permission to write the classics, to write the you know the, the, those books that it's like, this is essential, this is fundamental. And when I was thinking about your life the other day, I feel that there's a grace on you that the Lord said, I'm gonna give him permission to write the fundamental, the, the classic. That's why we're doing this stream because there's so many of you that this book is, this is a classic, this book is a fundamental. This is, there's certain books you have to have in your library and you know people by their library. You know, when people show up to my office and they see my library, they're like, oh yeah, you, you know, you're a real one. This is one of those books, it just came out, but I'm already calling it a classic, just like your previous book. And so guys, we're spamming the chat, you can get the link, it's pinned in the comment. I want you to go jump over to his channel and subscribe. I got to jump off. You know, I'm just going to say, hold on, we're almost done. I'm going to spend a few more minutes with you guys uh, talk, telling you about some really important things that we have going on. Can you guys all just shout out Pastor Apostle Pagani right now in the chat? Show him some love. Man, thank you for your contribution to the kingdom. Everybody stick around. Yeah, thanks for that. And we're not going to keep going there. <sighs> okay. Okay, Rob. <clears throat> How's your bookshelf look? You a real one? Well, you a real one? I have. So I I have uh, uh, Spurgeon sermons, um, and uh, the works of John Owen, the works of uh, William Perkins, and some other things like that. I feel like I'm those not, are classics. I don't know. You got like any Jim Baker back there? Do you got any? I feel like no, I don't. Uh, you got any Bill? Yeah, Johnson, I've got work maybe? to do. 
essentially. Got Bill, got Bill Johnson, yeah. Chris Valentin, got any, but you got any of those guys? <laughs> I, I don't. Um, uh... Although on the real, I, like I'm, I'm not against uh, pastors and uh, like Christians having these books for the purpose of uh, reading them and knowing what, what kind taught. of idiocy is existing out there that, that we need to, to deal with. Uh, I think okay. one of the things for me, it's such a shame that a man with such a great beard is teaching crap like that. It's a good beard. It really is a good beard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, and, and I thought who is so came into, with like, reformed theology. I thought that sort of a natural, like it grows out and then reformed theology sort of seeps from it. And then you like, well, it should, you know, like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. Um, I, 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 um, the, I, I think one of the, so one of the most major problems that I saw with, uh, in, in the things that they were saying is I do think, um, I think that they tried to, uh, there was like an attempt to, uh, caveat this or to, to, uh, uh, make a bit of a disclaimer here or there. They're like they did attempt to do this, but at the end of the day, a lot of what, like it would be easy for me as a young believer to walk away from this, blaming my sins that I still need to put to death, blaming my sinfulness on demons and curses of the past. I think that, that, that at the end of the day, um, it would be easy for me as a young believer to walk away from that particular video thinking, oh, this isn't th I, like I'm actually a victim here. This isn't my, like I I'm not responsible for this. What a relief. Right. Like, wow. Um, and, and and so to be clear, um, you like I think that Ezekiel 18 thing that we talked about, like right after they brought up Ezekiel 16, puts puts uh, most of what was said to bed uh, because it uh, the the fact that the soul who sins will die the father or the son is not going to pay for the sins of the father and uh, that kind of thinking um, in and of itself uh, kills the whole thing that he's been talking about the very fact that and it's important for you to know if you've been into this kind of deliverance, uh, stuff or whatever, um, and you're buying hook, line, and sinker into what he's been saying, um, that, uh, that, um, it, you know, it, demon, uh, demons are in you and that that's one of the causes of your sin. And, um, and then if that doesn't work, then curses are in you, uh, or, or on you still. And, and that is the cause of your sin. Um, understand that the scripture has no, has nothing to say like that. The scripture places your sin, the responsibility and cause of your sin squarely on you. And uh, no one else gets to, how, how unfair and unjust would our legal God be if he punished you for all eternity um, in hell for sins that were a demon's fault or that were a curse's fault? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, that's not how it works. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of that sin, the paycheck is death. Like period. It doesn't get any more plain than that. So um, that, that I think is uh, for me, the biggest scare uh, for videos like this is that people will walk away thinking my sin is not my responsibility. Yeah. Well, and that, that's been the general gist. I did one uh, sermon review on uh, somebody named Catherine Crick, which falls into the same category as these guys. She's not part of the club, but she falls in the same category. And that was a big takeaway from her video. The actual, the sermon review that I'm doing, well, by the time you guys see this, it has long been gone, but is from a guy, part of their group named Vlad, I think is his name. And it's the same thing you get from that video is like, oh, that's, it's, it's a demon. It's not, it's not my fault. Like really gets that this, these things are, I'm doing these things or I'm struggling with these things. And it really takes, like they'll say, I mean, he said a number of times, like Jesus saves you. The, if, you know, the efficacy of the cross, you know, saves you. But there's like, there's this continual, like, like you said, for a new believer, there would be this continual worry that like, there's always something 
like the the digger the digger the deeper I dig into um like a lot of these videos they do you come away with this idea that you will never there is no way to be free from these demons and these curses like you're you're continually if, if this logically works out you are continually going before the courtroom of heaven because you've left the door open or i mean unless you declare all legal right you know satan has no legal right over this person but then the person like we've already talked about there's going to be sanctification that happens you're going to struggle with something and so the outcome is either sinless perfection because you've declared legal right over this individual for god only or you fall into some sort of sin that that sanctification with and local church discipleship would work out of you but now you don't see that as a path you see that you're you're possessed again or there's another curse that you didn't know again and so yeah there's this this ridiculousness where these people keep probably getting in this line because well i'm not freed from this now now it's something else i mean yes christian that i mean there it's sanctification my friend like there are things that the the holy spirit is revealing to you that you need to deal with because of his word you don't need to get delivered <laughs> from some demon because of it. You need to work it out with prayer and supplication and, and within a local community of believers that are there for you to work beside you and to to be there for you. Um, it's just, it. I don't see how you could hold to this theology and not feel in bondage all the time, constantly. Like, yeah, I'm free, but I'm still enslaved. Like that language, I can, like, why would you not think that way? Because, yeah, I'm saved, but I'm still bound to a thousand things that I'm never going to be. Like, it's just, there's no hope. Like, even with Christ, there's no hope <laughs> in any of this. Because you're still struggling. You're still bound. You're still cursed. Um, it's just, it's crazy to me. Yeah, I think that he he definitely, um, you know, like you mentioned multiple times throughout, um, his tendency to, or, or at least maybe their outlook that... Um, and he said it a few times, their outlook that a, a Christian can still be in bondage, can still be chained. And I think the 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 right way to look at that is that a, a Christian is uh, free. Um, uh, you're, you're either one or the other. You're either a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. Those are the two options. But you're, you're captive, right, uh, one way or the other. Um, and a Christian can certainly be... Uh, slave to Christ and still love those chains, right? Like that, that's a thing for sure that, that we, we can still reach back down and, and look back to how great it was in Egypt, like how good we had it in Egypt kind of a thing. Right. Um, and, and I mean, that happens, but as far as uh, uh, still being enslaved and shackled uh, and not have control over um, sin. I mean, that's that's part of the work of Christ in the first place is to to purchase that freedom for us. That's actually what is maybe being talked about uh, that whom the sun sets free is free in deed, uh, um, not in the deed. Right. Right. So real quick, we're coming up on two and a half hours here. Um, you said you <laughs> wanted to briefly discuss the generational curses as it is portrayed in the scripture, which I think is going to be helpful in juxtaposition to what we just heard. So you want to get into that? Yeah. So what what they've done is taken um, essentially taken a little bit of scripture, something that the scripture does talk about um, this this idea, and they've taken it and and then taken this one little bit of scripture out of its context and then painted it all over their lenses, and then it's all over the scripture, right? Um, uh, and the, the Bible does talk about generational curses, okay? Um, and uh, this is in Exodus 20, Exodus 34, Numbers 14, and Deuteronomy 5. It's in different. So uh, notice all of those are in the, the Pentateuch, the Torah. And it's, it's specifically referring to Israel, the nation of Israel. Um, and it's specifically referring to or related to their idolatry. Um, so it's not about um, uh, what was some of the things that he talked about, adultery, um, stiff. What, what did he say about your mind? Stiff neckness. Oh, yeah. he talked about being stiff necked and it uh, being something to do with your forehead. Yeah, well, specifically so forehead. 
yeah. So uh, the the sin specifically that is talked about in reference to generational curses, which is in reference specifically to the nation of Israel, and um, is idolatry. That's what it is talking about, and it it is in context. It's already been too long. We don't have time to go into it, but do the research yourself, right? In context, what these uh, generational curse scriptures are talking about is not that the uh, sins of the fathers um, are going to be taken out on the sons. That's not what it's talking about. It's the idolatry of dad, for instance, um, is very likely going to bleed into the son who is being raised by that dad and that son uh, i mean all uh, has that uh, not going for him <laughs> right and so that he very likely will end up being idolatrous who then will have a son who will very likely end up being idolatrous and what happens that breaks these generational curses in the scriptures is repentance it's actually pretty simple when they when Israel any time in the Old Testament that Israel confessed and was and you know sackcloth and ashes repented ran back to the one true God uh, tore down the Asherah uh, poles tore down the the high places that that they would worship other gods anytime they did that uh, they were brought back and God forgave their sins and God uh, like that's what the generational curse is. Yeah, it's not some mystical witchcraft hex that's on you from your parents' past or whatever, and your bloodline. That that is complete fabrication. It's not what's in the text at all. So, I don't well, know. and it's not even it's not even the Jewish interpretation of it. I believe it's the Talmud. I wish I would. I, I'm almost positive it's the Talmud that is that commentates on this text and has the exact same uh, interpretation of this text as you just said. Of course, how the father acts will then affect the son and how the son acts, of course, will affect his son. And it will waterfall down because of that. And that is how the, the Jewish rabbis saw the text, not in a bloodline generational curse. Again, that there's a lot of theology behind that. It, it, a lot of what he's actually talking about is actually a lot of ironically post Constantinian theology in regards to sin being transferred from the blood. But the idea is that if you're going even back to Jewish exegetical methods, what you just said is exactly how they would have, how they've written it, how, how the Jewish rabbi saw it and wrote it down. So, um, so there, there's, um, I, I want to, one of the articles that I pulled up and, um, uh, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read two sentences from this article that I pulled up. And I think it's probably what you're talking about. Um, it, it says a Jewish Targum, uh, specifies you, yeah. that this Target passage letter. refers to quote ungodly fathers and quote rebellious children. Uh, so it's not unjust for God to punish sin to the third or fourth generation. Those generations are committing the same sins their ancestors did. So it's their own sin that is being punished. It's not because of something that like I'm not held captive because of my grandfather or great grandfather. That's not how that works. If I were not committing this sin, it would not be like I wouldn't be uh, like the sin in and of itself is uh is what causes the punishment it's not the punishment that is causing the sin which is what they were kind of saying right yeah. it, it's the curse that is the cause of my like it's the opposite the opposite is true biblically yeah so all right hopefully first of all if you guys have gotten to two hours and 30 minutes you are the mvps you are the real ones Wow. Congratulations to you. Hopefully this was helpful for you guys. Um, again, one of the reasons that I like doing long form content like this is because there's no way you can be like, Oh, you took a clip out of context. We listened to everything they said in the order they said it. And we could have addressed a lot more. This video could be five hours. If we were to literally pick every verse they went through and go through it, it would be a much longer video. Clearly can't do that. Uh, my mental state can't take it. I don't know if Rob's can either. So right. hopefully this was helpful. We'll have, I'm going to have more videos coming out 
in regards to this. This will be in the Babylon Pastor playlist, but also this will be in another Deliverance playlist. So if you're interested in those other videos, probably by the time this whole thing comes out, there'll be more in there. You can check those out. Um, because this is, it, I, I am totally confident in saying this is a very dangerous theology to hold to because it is, it is, in, it is just uniquely unhelpful and clearly reads a number of passages purposefully and correctly, it seems like to me, and presents a gospel that is not a freeing gospel at all. So it's very works-based uh, in, in essence, really. So again, hopefully that was helpful to you guys. If you liked it, leave a like. You know, get those likes up, get those numbers up. There's no free copy of anything yeah. other. And buy the book. Yeah, there's no book to buy uh, yet. So I'll talk <laughs> to you guys later. See ya. Bye.